Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. Drew's back. We're Brian all back. back. My goodness. Uh, I feel like we should explain our outfits here. It happens to be Halloween on this day. Yes, we're recording this on Halloween. No one will be thinking about Halloween by the time this video publishes, but we're both dressed up. We're going trick-or-treating with our kids after this. We had a costume contest earlier today. And uh, so y'all get to enjoy a little And glimpse. a chili and mac and cheese cook-off. That was, we'll talk more about that <sighs> I'm later. I'm very full. I can take a nap happening. right now. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, Ooh. fun little intro there. Uh, welcome though to number 111. 111. Of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about pilot replacement nibs and why they don't offer them, pilot flexible gold nibs and which one you should go after, the smoothest gold nibs that we've ever used, what are the Pokemon starter pens of the fountain pen world? the most slender pens available. Uh, we're gonna be having Micah on from our receiving team. So we'll get to see another base on the Goulet team. Micah's actually been on here before, like back in the right now days. That's right. But it's been a while. It so it'll be good to see him again. Uh, and we'll have three weeks worth of nonsense to catch up with each other on. So Drew was, I was off and then Drew was off. And then, so we've missed each other, but you know, We'll catch up nice on camera. Nice to see you again, Brian. It's good to see you too, Drew. You're looking rather dapper, if I say so. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> this is the only time I'll ever wear a suit, basically, is when <laughs> it's a, as a joke. Anyway, uh, let's start off with some feedback. All right. Uh, we've got one bit of feedback from uh, Tatiana. And uh, Tatiana says, of the new products, the Endless Explorer refillable journal sounded right up my alley as I'm in love with traveler's notebooks and the whole system of it. Cool. I was intrigued by the idea of cactus leather and looked at the Goulet uh, description on the website. Yep. I noticed that at the bottom of the description, there's a note that says there's a typo on the back of the box claiming that it's made of cactus leather instead of full grain leather. Yeah. That explains Drew's confusion uh, last week, uh, last episode, on how it could be classified as full grain leather if it was in fact made of cactus. Just an interesting detail I noticed. I'm hoping to get one soon. Yay for seven millimeter dot grid. I'm also ecstatic to see the Goulet Pencast stickers available as a set. Can't wait to purchase. So I figured this comment was a good segue for me to actually, you know, reiterate Tatiana's confusion uh, after we recorded it. I did add a bit in the description of the last episode, but after we recorded last episode, we were made aware that uh, there was indeed a typo, as Tatiana said, hence my confusion because there was conflicting evidence. The uh, Endless Explorer that is exclusive to the Goulet Pen Company that does include a seven millimeter dot grid is in fact full grain, actual animal hide leather, not yes. cactus leather. So um, sorry about that. Adrian and I were both very confused. Um, understandably so, so. Yeah, understandably. We were all confused. Yeah, so we figured that uh, out yeah. after the fact. So, um, yes, uh, apologies for that misunderstanding, but it's a very nice notebook nonetheless, and um, at least Tatiana enjoys it. So, anyway, check it out. There you go. Definitely not cactus. Uh, Heather Gleiser says, as a hockey nerd, I am cracking up at the Brandon interview because I know exactly why being a Flyers fan is depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Given the way things went for the Penguins last year, I can empathize. Mm. The Meet the Team segments have been great, and I'm excited for more. Well, you're getting well, more. You're getting more. One more today. And Rory says simply, the Kool-Aid pen cast. And Brian, I don't know if you watched any of the last episode, but I, I will say, yet, but no. I will say, the intro, I did a pretty good job on. I, I, got, I think I got pretty much the whole thing without looking. However... When I said welcome to the Goulet podcast, pencast, I pretty much said welcome to the Kool-Aid pencast. <laughs> I That's probably there, what was picked up in the YouTube like there, uh, closed caption as well. It right? sound no, I went back and listened to it. I'm like, I said Kool-Aid pencast. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, I'm pro I probably said Kool-Aid pencast, but it totally sounds like I said welcome to the Kool-Aid pencast. Intro is not as easy to do as I make it look, you know. I guess I devoted <laughs> all of my energy to, m memorizing, to memorizing the it. superfluous and extemporaneous part that I'm like yeah. the cool the Kool Aid Kool Aid what I don't know. That's all right. So I could, I could get on yeah. board with the Kool Aid pen. A guys. couple people <laughs> brought that up. I'm like, oh come oh, yeah. on! I'm sure I'm sure it doesn't actually <laughs> sound like. No, it definitely does. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, hey, you know what? Welcome to the Kool Aid Pencast. Maybe it's like a Yanni Laurel type thing where you hear what you want to hear. Maybe. You know, remember that? That was Maybe. big. What was that? Like five years ago? Yeah, something like that. Around yeah. the. We'll throwback for y'all blue dress white dress time <laughs> all right i got some feedback here it's from peter young says 
Is Brandon a Goulet? Strong resemblance, both physically and mannerisms? He was not the only person that asked this question. I, as far as I know, there is no blood relation there. But he's a part of the Goulet family, you know? Yes. We're all kind of a family. But no, not 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 in any physical capacity. I'm surprised. I never picked up on that. But this was, this was not the singular comment. I was like, really? I wonder what about Brandon seemed Goulet-y. I don't know. Huh. Good question. Yeah. But no, 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 no relation. Good guy, though. All right. Uh, the Robbie says, I have penabled four people in the last few months. Good job. It would be great if you guys could put together a penabler pet, uh, penabler set, excuse me, uh, where you could get an entry level pen, ink, and notebook with a one click solution. Um, okay. We don't have anything called the penabler set, um, but we definitely have a fountain pen starter set that is a pen, ink, and paper. It's a Metropolitan, Rhodia, dot pad, and an ink. I don't remember what it is, but. That's on the website right now. Yeah, so that we'll works. Check that out for sure. Yeah. yeah, like that's an easy one. And in fact, I have a video that's coming out next week, uh, just a few days after this publishes. That is pretty much like fountain pen things, like fountain fountain pen pen ink paper set at different price points for the purpose of somebody who's into fountain pens giving it to somebody who's new to fountain pens. So I'm curating like was I think six different sets together for exactly this purpose. So you will have to check out that video as soon as it comes out. And then Heather Gleiser says as did a- Did we do two from Heather? I did, oh my God. You did? Wait, no, no, sorry, no? I forgot to, it's the same comment. I had it for me and then I gave oh, it to you or whatever. There you go. Okay, well, Heather's still <laughs> cracking up about Brandon. <laughs> um, okay, that's feedback for this week. Uh, let's talk about some new stuff because there's plenty. All right. First off, if you're listening to this on Friday, November 3rd, head on over to our website for some awesome Fountain Pen Day deals. Happy late Fountain Pen Day as well. Yeah, Fountain I, Pen Day was yesterday. Yes. No. Well, it's, it's today. Today is Friday? No, today, when this publishes, it Fountain will be Fountain Pen Day. Fountain Pen Day is on Friday? Day. Yeah. I thought it was a Thursday. It's always a first Friday. Happy Fountain Pen Day, everybody. Yeah, I probably should have led <laughs> with that. Sorry. I'm very thrown off with it being Halloween. Yeah. Didn't even think about the fact that yes, Fountain Pen Day is happening. But That's why I edited it in here. I'm really glad you did because I am not cognizant there are, of that we're doing, of the We're week. doing a lot of stuff, y'all. A ton of stuff. Too yeah. much stuff because we've got a lot of new stuff to cover. So we can't cover all of our Fountain Pen deals right yeah. now. But trust us, if you're listening to this on Fountain Pen Day, head over to the website. There's a ton of stuff. Rachel did a great job yeah. curating it for you. Everything's going to be easy to find. All the deals are going to be one place. There's a lot. Check it out. There's a lot of them. Some really cool stuff. For sure. Um, and even if you don't see this on Fountain Pen Day, we'll have some deals that are running through the weekend. So yes. check those out. All right. But in happy Fountain Pen Day, everybody. For if you're not familiar with what Fountain Pen Day is, it's essentially a made-up holiday that we came up with organically in the pen community about 12 years ago or so, uh, something like that, 11, 12 years ago. And uh, yeah, it's just we were like, fountain pens are awesome. We should have a day where we just celebrate how much we love fountain pens. And that's first Friday of November every year. So here we are. And uh, yeah, just use your pens, talk about them, share some love. Just have a good time with fountain pens. And, and enjoy some deals. Enjoy some deals. You are There's also so inclined. Other, other retailers have good deals too, so check all those out. Um, yeah, good deals to be had. All right, I got some new stuff to talk about. These I'm really excited about. The Magna Carta Mag 600. New brand alert. New brand. So this is a brand that we've actually had, we've been talking to them for years, um, but they're not as well known. They're a more boutique brand, um, but they make some pretty legit stuff. So they're based out of India. It's pretty innovative stuff too. Very innovative, yeah. So uh, Hiran, uh, who's the guy behind the brand, uh, met him at the DC show and got to spend some good time with him. Got to talk to him a lot about how these pens are made and we've been playing with them. And it's like, all right, this guy's got some pretty legit stuff. So, um, you know, he makes all kinds of different pens, but we're starting out, we're easing our way in with these two pens, the Mag 600 and the Mag 1000. <clears throat> and both of them are pretty cool and have some very unique stuff going on. So uh, the Mag 600 is $350. And if you just look at it, you know, a picture on the website, you're like, it's a black pen. Like, what's the big deal? Well, first off, the whole thing is ebonite, which is pretty cool. Uh, so, you know, hard rubber, as it may be said. Uh, and it's also got an ebonite feed as well, which you don't see on a lot of pens. But the coolest part about it is the nib. It has what's called the True Flex nib. It's a 14 karat nib. And I don't want to hype it up too much. So I will be reserved when I say that 
if you have felt underwhelmed by flex nibs in the past, this one will probably live more up to the expectations that you would hope for a, a true flex nib. Um, there, did I do a good job of not, so. not overhyping it? So I've used vintage flex nibs and there's always been that like, why don't they make flex nibs like they used to? And we legitimately asked, oh yeah, the lights, look at that, look at Drew remembering. Um, we were legitimately asked him, we were like, why can't you make flex nibs like you used to? And he's like, well, I can. And he's like, I'll explain how. And he went into a whole lot of really deep technical stuff of why. It has literally to do with like the metallurgy of how the nib is manufactured, how the molecules bond in the alloy and all this kind of stuff so that it gets the right amount of spring back. It's amazingly complex and sounds very complicated. And I understand why most people don't do it that way, but he felt very passionate about basically reproducing vintage flex nibs. So he modeled it after a bunch of vintage flex nibs and looked at other, you know, reputable nibs like, you know, Omos and other things like that, that have had some flexibleness and uh, kind of reverse engineered it and came up with his own. So uh, if you are really into flex, try these out and let us know what you think. Cause we genuinely want like these to get in people's hands and see what they're like. And for $350, yeah, it's expensive for a pen, but not for what you're getting. I think like it's got a lot of bang for the buck. It's a gold nib too. Yeah. 14 K. So really cool. It's like there I'm are, there are steel nibs for that price. Yeah, absolutely. And you can, you can, you can really flex this thing pretty darn well. So this will be a lot of fun for us to play around with. We'll certainly be showing it off more in the future. Um, and then the other pen that we have is one that I alluded to if you saw my favorite big pens video. So- Is it a big pen, Brian? It's a big freaking pen. It can't be that big. It's pretty dang big. Yeah, you It's know, pretty big. We actually- Like an so, all-American? Uh, well, girth-wise, it's big. I don't know that it's the girthiest pen that we've ever had because I think about pens like the Dolce Vita oversize like back in the day. That thing was girthy. That's the arc. And like the Emperor is pretty thick, but it, this one's up there. Oh, it's enormous. But it's very long. Yeah. And the nib is, I believe it's the biggest production nib available today. Up to date, I believe it's been the Emperor nib has been the biggest. I think this one beats it out. It I have not used enormous. I have not used a larger nib than this. I, I've not actually seen a larger nib than this. I have, but only in like a custom, like comically oversized kind of, you know, thing. There's a pen brand called Toma that has a very large nib that's larger than the Emperor. This is larger than that. I think this that. is larger than that. Yeah. yeah, this is the biggest nib made today. I believe so. So it's massive. I mean, it writes, it writes well. It's not like the size necessarily like makes it write that different per it's se. It's a bit of a novelty, but- It definitely is a novelty. Yeah. It's like a boat oar. Yeah. The thing is so big, <laughs> but it looks, Unreal. I mean, if you hold it up next to a Lamy Safari or a Pilot Vanishing Point, it looks or like a baseball bat. It looks comical. So it's pretty wild, um, but it genuinely like, writes pretty well. It's got an Ebonite feed on it as well. Um, so that one's available in a fine and a medium. Oh, I should have mentioned the True Flex. It's only one nib size. I think it's comparable to like a fine nib, um, but it's pretty good size overall. But yeah, you fine or medium for the uh, Mag 1000. Uh, and it is just. It's just wild. You just got to see this pen. Um, and then we also have a new Twisby Eco T color, the T that is slightly triangular in its grip and is triangular instead of hexagonal in the cap and finial. So yeah, that's cool. Red, it's like a nice pure red. Yeah, you know? it's not a scary alarm red. No, no, it's like a, I don't know, what kind of red would you call that? I, to like me, a, it's a botanical red. Okay. To yeah. me, it looks like a, a something a little bit more natural, not as alarming. Okay. Not like a grading paper or mm, you know, okay. you know, EMS, you know, warning red. It's okay. a it's a more comfortable natural red to me. Yeah. There you go. That's fitting. Like something you could find on a flower. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Um, that one's thirty two ninety nine. So you can go check those out. All the nib sizes. And then uh, we have a new sailor as well. Sailor nineteen eleven L. Actually, it's like five different colors. Uh, it's the Ringless Galaxy. So if you don't like all the bling typically associated with the Sailor 1911L, you can check out the Ringless Galaxy. And it's uh, you know, a little more, oh, I don't know. I'm not gonna say pure because that doesn't mean anything. Just more um, uh, minimalist, yeah. I guess, in its, in its trim so that you really see the material pop more. Um, so it comes in a green, which is called Crab Nebula. 
a red that's called Orion, a purple that is Mag Magellanic Clouds. Magellanic? No, Magellanic Clouds, right? Magellan. Magellan-ish. Yeah. <laughs> um, blue is Ple Pleiades. Is that right? Pleiades? I think, I think, so. think so. And then brown is Andromeda. So spare. Andromeda. And Andromeda. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can go check those out. They are beautiful and they're $260, which is not too shabby. And they are, I believe, are they stainless steel nibs? I think they might be. Let me double check that real quick because that seems very inexpensive. I'm still kind of catching up from being I out think myself. They're gold. Are they gold nib at 260 I think so. Oh, okay. So because they, that's right, because they had a ringless that they came out before, but it was like 500 some dollars. They were the and metallics, they weren't so, they? They were the metallics. They didn't do Those so Those were super hot. expensive. They were like a premium, but I think they like wanted to go a different route with these ones. Yeah, I think these are a good deal. Yeah. Because I remember- well, I'd like see, it like seems cheaper than, because yeah. I think that would be like one of the most affordable 1911 L's yeah. that you can get. Type in ringless. Yeah, I will do that. <laughs> I can't um, do anything I know. Yeah. talk at the same time. Um, so- I'm um, double checking. It is- It looks- uh, yeah, 21K nib, hot dang. That's a good deal. Okay, for, so. For, and that's the larger nib too. It's the, yeah, it's the midsize. It's not the king of pens, but it's the It's mid. the L, yeah. Yeah, so if you're interested in a Sailor 21K nib, check out these ringless galaxies. It's and a good look, way to get it. They look really nice too. They're nice, like darker, kind of like jewel tones with some glitter and stuff going on. It's nice. Black trim. Mm. Mm -hmm. I like it. They're lovely. I like it. Um, You know what's not a affordable pen? <laughs> Uh, Waldman. Depends on who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. If Jeff Bezos were here. Uh, no, uh, Waldman has come out with two very, very limited edition pens. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on here because it's not going to appeal to most of you. But it's worth a look because they're very fascinating pens. Um, one pen is called the Private Eye of Baker Street. And the other one is called the Dame of Swan Court, respectively inspired by the works of Arthur Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie. <laughs> um, this is a collaboration that Waldman is doing. I won't get into all the details, but they're doing it with a company who is known for including historical artifacts in their production line of products. This is happening with these pens as well. Both pen boxes will include a piece of a written letter by Agatha Christie or Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So if you are a fan of their literary works and happen to be a fan of fountain pens and happen to have a uh, $21,200 just laying around, um, yeah. Then here is the opportunity for you to uh, honestly get a. They're not writing anymore, so you know pieces of their physical written works are in short supply. Kind of cool. So yeah, this is an opportunity for you. There are twenty three pieces being made of the Arthur Conan Doyle pen, and then thirty eight of the Agatha Christie. So there you go. At least checking out on our website. We've got some nice pictures is for you worth, to consider. At least some eye candy you can enjoy. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, more accessible will be the Diplomat Nexus demo. So mm -hmm. the Diplomat Nexus is not a new model, but the demo is at $316. You can now have your Diplomat Nexus, which is a, a barrel filler pen, but it's done in a kind of... Uh, uh, it, the Japanese style um, barrel filler pens are... Uh, they lock off, you mm -hmm. know, this one also locks off, but not using a, you know, uh, fake piston at the end. It locks off when you cap it. So it's a pretty unique operation. Um, but uh, you can see more. Brian has a video on the Nexus that you can click on here if I remember to add it later. Um, <laughs> they will be available in black with silver trim and blue with silver trim. And if you like sloshy ink, you know, ebbing and flowing back and forth between your you know, it's a very large capacity pen. So yeah, a, uh, clear, ink, yeah. a clear version is definitely uh, good for this particular pen. A lot Solid of ink. Pen. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Lloydstrom's coming out with some new books. In this case, we've got Apricot, Lobster, Sky, and Ink. That is uh, orange, red, blue, and purple. Ink is purple, by the way. I was surprised by that. It's just called Ink, but it's purple. So Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, ink can be purple, sure. It certainly can. So these are all A5 notebooks. Uh, they're the dot grid, and they are $24.50. Very familiar books. We've been selling them for many, many years, and uh, they rotate their colors pretty frequently. So this is the new set. And nice. if you'd like, you can get matching pen loops that stick inside of them for $4.95 a piece. So these are also in the same colors. And we've got a couple new products from Waringal, uh, the first being a new ink. So for $22 now available is Old Man in the Sea. That is a 30 mil dark teal with some red shimmer. I got the opportunity to write with that uh, 
this week, Brian, and yeah. it is, um, I think it is a comfortable amount of shimmer. Okay. It was not overly saturated. I feel like it would not be super cloggy, but mm -hmm. there's just enough to add some punch and pizzazz okay. to the writing. So I yeah. actually am a big fan of that. Ink. Okay. Okay. It's a fine not line to walk sometimes. With I think so. Yeah. yeah. And Wearing Goal also is coming out with, uh, or we are also offering Wearing Goal's um, ink cards in two new varieties. We have their ink cards available um, that have pictures of bottles on them that you can add to their card um, notebook. Uh, it's not really a notebook. It's a binder. Card holder. Uh, card holder, yeah. yeah. These are going to be the same size as those. They're going to be 90 by 50 millimeters. So same size, $5 for 50 sheets of these new cards. But instead of the ink bottle being printed on them, there is one with an ash leaf and one with an ink droplet. These are different in that you don't just get to swab anywhere you want. They're coated specifically so that your ink stays within the confines of the printed shapes, being mm -hmm. the leaf or the ink droplet. So a little bit more unique of a situation than the other ones. So if you'd like to have a little bit more of a restricted shape, then these are the cards for you. Yeah. And you can cool. still add them to your If you have book. trouble coloring inside the lines, this makes it easy for you. This is what you've been waiting for. <laughs> so that is it. A lot of new products, and there are even more that There's we, more unfortunately, were not able to get to that have come out in weeks past. If you're curious about more, check out the um, new, the what's new section of our website. We've got a lot of stuff there. And they're coming yep. soon as well. Tons of stuff coming down the pipeline. It's the holidays, so we're going to be seeing a lot. Yeah, once pretty much once Fountain Pen Day kicks off, we know that like, a lot of manufacturers are going to be like, all right, this is it. It's go time. Let's get these products out. That it's we've feeling like go time. So, yep, it's, it'll, it'll, it'll be a nice little pace of things coming out for the next couple of months. Yes. It'll be a good time. All right, cool. Well, let's get into the Q&A, shall we? Let's. All right. So, Q number one for you to A all right. is from ID Hama, uh, 1752. Mm. Why does <clears throat> Pilot not sell replacement nibs? Well, they do. You just have to buy it on a pen. So Simple. That, there's your answer. Easy peasy. It costs as much as a pen and you get the replacement nib, but you also get a spare pen body as well. For free. Yeah, for free. Wow. Yeah, isn't that cool? That's a, what so, a deal. So uh, there you go. Next question. I'm kidding. Um, basically, it comes down to cost and logistics. Um, we've talked to them about this, and they've, you know, they've inquired with us before with uh, Pilot USA. Anyway, it's definitely not something that Pilot like offers globally. I think partly because, you know, they have some. I don't know how much they are doing like lean manufacturing per se, but I don't think they're just sitting on like piles of nibs. Uh, they're they're pretty well manufacturing nibs for the purpose of going on the pens that they have. So um, I think some of it is like a capacity thing, especially with certain, you know, cause they have a lot of different nibs uh, that they use. You know, it's different than something like Lamy where they're using, you know, maybe a couple different nib designs on pretty much all their pen models um, or sailors sharing a lot as well. They have a lot of grinds, but they're all nib sizes, but Pilot has like a big range of very different nib sizes, you know, steel and gold. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's just a lot more for them to coordinate, you know, having spare nibs. Not that they couldn't do it. Um, so I think we've been, we've inquired before and talked to Pilot USA about getting spare nibs. Um, we have, I'm, I'm going back quite a ways now, probably a decade or so. We had inquired about doing like spare Falcon nibs and, and other things like that. But they've never offered just the nib alone. It was always the nib with the feed and the grip. It's basically a whole grip section of the pen. And when they priced it out for us, I want to say it was like 60 or 65% the cost of an entire new pen. So it's like, ugh, it's not really saving a whole lot. I mean, yeah, it's cheaper than buying a whole new pen, but then, you know, what do you, what are you getting? You, you, you know, it's sadness. It's, so, you know, it's, it's something that would, would kind of cost so much. Cause like a lot of the cost of the pen is in the nib, um, with pretty much any pen, except for, you know, when you get to a certain price point, um, there's probably a lot more that goes into the bodies of some of the pens, you know, and you like a Machia and stuff like that. Um, but at the lower end range, you know, the nib is a huge portion of the cost. Um, and then uh, we just really didn't feel that there would be a lot of interest at the price. You know, we had some people that were inquiring back in the day and we were thinking about special ordering back when we did more of that. And uh, when we told them the price, they were like, whoa, no thanks. So there really wasn't a lot of interest when we got the price quoted out. Um, and then I don't know if they would even offer that on something like, I mean, how would you even do that on a custom 823 or anything like that. It's like, you really wouldn't be able to. So um, we've asked about the steel nibs too, 
But the cost of the logistics of just like offering a steel nib, there would be like custom packaging, there'd be this blah, 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 a lot of different things. So um, it basically would cost the same as getting like a Kakano or maybe even cost more for some weird reason. Um, but pretty much you can buy a lower end pilot pen for about the price of what they would have to offer a spare nib for. I mean, a Kakano is like $14. Even yeah, 14, like a, if you so, wanted to get a Yovo replacement steel nib, you're paying, you you're know, paying more 25. Than yeah. Yeah. Monteverde or Goulet nibs, Lamy nibs, they all cost more than that. Yeah. So yes, they could technically offer it, but what would it be like? $13 or $12 or something. I don't even know yeah. um, if they could even do that. So you're either at the full price of a Kakuno there or more than halfway to a Metropolitan or Explorer. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it just kind of comes down to logistics. It just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for that. I also think that, you know, over the years, I, I don't have a perfect catalog in my brain of the pilot nibs that I've used or disassembled, but I feel like the style of end on the pilot nibs can vary wildly as well, even if they're the same Style size. Nib. So you've got some, the very end of the pilot nib, once it's off the feed, some of them do this dovetail style of end. Some of them have a hole in them. Mm -hmm. Some of them are notched on the side, all so that they can fit into a particular uh, feed. But I feel like that has changed over the years every now and then. Mm. And I know that Pilot has tried to save some gold here and there mm -hmm. by putting additional notches in their yeah. nibs. So if they were to offer replacement nibs, their new nibs might not be compatible with a model from like, you know, 2005 or something like that. So maybe most of the notches that I can recall at least were not crucial to the, like the function of the nib or like it, it didn't cause any different fit yeah i know the circle one doesn't like fit over a notch onto that circle no there's so. definitely there's definitely some nibs that are like more notch yeah oriented in terms of its fit yeah but i if i i'm really having to dig deep in my memory yeah here. that's i'm not think, i'm not confident that that's I, really I th the case i but. think well because you get like the number what three which is like the small one like what was on the stargazer yeah. um the stella and all that uh the Number five is the one that's on the custom 74 um, and all that. And then it goes, it kind of goes up from there. I'm not I want to say some of the smaller ones have more of those notches and stuff, but I think the notches are consistent across the pen models that have that size nib. Yeah. So I'm not aware if they were to offer a spare nib that it would, you would have compatibility issues if you're using it that same model of pen. Then it might look different though. It might be that they didn't used to have those little cutouts or notches or yeah. whatever, and the new ones might. But even still, you know, they they i think kind of fundamentally they because they make all their own nibs they don't want to offer just their nibs um i don't know any especially the japanese brands that offer just their nibs no because they don't want people buying their nibs and then making other pens and putting their nibs on their pens I, they're also not big fans of user serviceability they yeah, when they, it comes to nibs they don't sure. even like you taking the nib off yeah that's why they have only when they have offered them has only been like on an entirely like installed grip section. And it's like, because then you're just swapping out the grip of the pen. Yeah, they really don't, they really don't want people messing with their nibs. No. So, so I don't think we'll ever see that. No, honestly. I think there are too many factors at play. You never know, but it's not something we're like pushing super hard for because the logistics kind of don't really make sense. And honestly, way. there hasn't been a ton of demand for it. There hasn't. I mean, some spare nibs are popular, but most people just want a pen that works and they're just gonna use that pen. Yeah. But it's nice to have the option. You can always tinkerer. pay that same amount that you would for a new gold nib, which would be over $150 every time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like the cheapest gold nib is going to be $150. Yeah. Um, that's like a Yovo. Mm -hmm. You could pay a half that and send it to a nib technician and get it made perfect for you. You could, you could. Yeah, it's true. All right. Next question we have here. This is from Plan Create Cope. Oh, I didn't see that. Good job. Yeah. Usually I'm, usually you're the one that makes up Plan a word. Plan to Cope. That's what I was going to say. Uh, All right. Very thank cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, not always very accurate with my reading. Uh, Drew. Yeah. Period. I'm interested in a Pilot Falcon. Period. Or is it just the nib that I want on any other model? So confused. I just ordered an E95S and I can't wait to get it. I have been lettering with a nib holder and hunt nibs. Just wanting something with variation and a gold nib. I've watched your other videos on flex nibs, but I still am confused about the Pilot 
Falcon. I don't blame you. Um, it is a bit of a confusing situation. So uh, I will say that I don't know if you just want the Falcon or the Falcon nib, but uh, I think you'll be happy with either. I'm so it's the nib. The, Most people are not like, oh, I got to have that Falcon body. Well, there's There are two. <laughs> there's a couple of Falcon nibs, aren't there? Well, that's so, true. Here's the thing. So on the Pilot Falcon, which is the Yalabo in Japan, um, you will find the true falcon nib. It looks like a beak. It arcs, mm -hmm. it curves, it has a feed that arcs and curves as well. So that is the progenitor falcon nib. So Progenitor? I don't know that word. Of progeny, yeah. Like oh. the, wait, maybe I used it reverse. Did you? Progenitor, I gotta look that up. No, progeny is the is what comes after. Progenitor yeah, is what yeah. comes before. Like your progeny is like your descendants. Yeah, progenitor right? is the thing that comes first, I think. Anyway. Is it? I don't know. I will look it up. Anyway, you're about, about to feel one. stupid if that's not the case. No, it's, it's um, yeah, a so, person. Okay, progenitor, a person or thing from which a person, animal, or plant is descended or originates, an ancestor or parent. There so you, you used it correctly. I've just, Fantastic. I don't think I've ever heard anyone use that word in conversation. All right, so it's a first. And if if Pee Wee Herman was here, maybe it would be the word of the day. <laughs> ah, <laughs> progenitor. Um, oh, so he died. Didn't the, he? Yes, he, he died did. recently. Paul Rubens. Yeah. No. Sorry. RIP. Um, so anyway, the Falcon nib, that's the original. It has a lot of great line variation, a lot of great nib sizes as well. You can even get an extra fine. So with an extra fine, you're going to get a lot of variation. Um, not a flex nib. It's a soft nib because the Falcon nib also comes in a not soft version. Mm -hmm. So after that was popular, they came out with a FA nib, mm -hmm. which stands for Falcon. However, it does not look like that falcon. It does not have that beak shape. It looks like a standard nib with two chunks bitten out of it, like Cookie mm -hmm. Monster got to it. Mm. That nib, the FA nib, you will find on a multitude of different pens. In the US, it is only available on the Custom Heritage 912 and the Custom 743. So that's what we have access to in the US. And those two FA nibs are also not identical. They are shaped the same. However, one, the one on the 743, is larger than the one on the Custom Heritage 912. So we've got three different Falcon nibs. The, the Falcon Falcon, technically that's also on the Metal Falcon, but they're the same nib. And then we've got the FA on the 743 and the FA on the 912. Now, you could argue that every Falcon nib is also a Metal Falcon because it's made of metal. Quiet, you. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to maximize confusion <laughs> here. <laughs> they all write really nicely. Um, I was uh, of the opinion for a long time that the Falcon wrote vastly superior to the FA on the 912, which I owned and I love. Um, and I thought that it was because the feed on the Falcon was made with that Falcon nib in mind, which is a more flexible nib probably needs a little bit extra flow. So I was convinced that, that that feed is a better feed than the one on the 912, which you can also get in regular, broad, fine, medium, whatever. So I think I thought that. But then the 743 came out and I used that. Mm. And that wrote, in my experience, tremendously better than the 912 did. I had better luck with that one too. But I haven't had a ton of experience with that. So I can't say for sure. But in the little experience I have had, the 743... Um, did outperform the 912 as far as the FA nib goes. So the, the custom 912 has the number, the pilot number 10 size nib. So a little bit smaller. A little bit smaller. So it's in between like a custom 823 or a custom 7043 and the custom 74. So it's like halfway in between. Yeah. Um, the custom 912, you and I both used it and we were like, ah, oh, kind of hard starting and all It that likes stuff. a higher angle. It it is it a little a toothy because right? I got an extra fine. Rachel writes with a higher angle and she could use it like flawlessly every yeah. time. And she thought it was awesome. And you and I use it and we were like, Gah. like we had inconsistency yeah. issues. I learned, I learned to make it work. And I actually, yeah. you know, I got it ground to a double extra fine. So Ooh. mine's like a knife blade, but I love it. It's my favorite pen. That sounds terrible. And I replaced the feed. But anyway, <laughs> um, I will say that if you are a letterer and you are looking for line variation, I would recommend the standard Falcon in an extra fine because you want to start with as fine as a stroke as possible so mm -hmm. you can get a little bit of variation. Yeah. However, it's still not a flex nib. It's a bouncy nib. You will get some line variation, but mm -hmm. if you're used to dip calligraphy nibs, you are not going to be able to do your thing. Mm -hmm. um, going back to what Brian said earlier, though, about the Magna Carta Mag 600, if you are a 
if you've been practicing calligraphy and lettering using a dip nib, that pen, the Mag 600, is going to be the closest thing you can buy in the US, in my opinion, to a dip pen. It's still gonna be not the same. It's a, it's a fountain pen. So the demands of the ink are completely different than what you're gonna have with a dip nib. But in our experience, that Mag 600 is a league above anything that the Pilot is currently offering, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, it definitely definitely stands out. It's yeah. not going to be as fine. No, that's the thing. You, know? you, you are you so are going to sacrifice fineness, but but you get the the variation you get with it, like how broad it goes, can kind of make up for it. For sure. And so visually, you can get more of that, you know, uh, uh, difference between like thin and broad stroke. My, if you really wanted to get something perfect, I would recommend getting the Mag Six Hundred custom ground to an extra fine Ooh. through a nib technician. Oh, hey um, that, that would be, that would be it. That'd be pretty rad. Yeah. So um, hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Um, but yeah, to Brian's point, the, mm -hmm. the nib is what you're after. The pen is just a vehicle for the nib as yeah. a, when it comes to the Falcon or the uh, uh, 743 for that matter. It's still a lovely pen, but yeah. you're buying it for the nib. But the E95S, I think you're gonna enjoy that too. You can yeah. get a little bit of line variation with that one too, but just don't go too nuts with it. All, All right. right. Question number three is from Cringe Central. Uh, in your opinion, <laughs> love it. what is the smoothest gold nib you've ever used? Hmm. I got a couple that come to mind. I mean, I could just give one answer, but that'd be a very short. All answer. right. Well, give give one answer and then some honorable mentions. The first one that came to mind was the Pelican M600 in broad. And the reason I'm so specific with that is because that Rachel has like eight of them. She loves that nib. I did not know that. Oh yeah. The M600. M600. Huh. That's like the perfect size for her hand. And the Pelican Suvron series, like the 400, 600, 800,000, they're kind of like Pilot, where they have like, it's a similar nib, but it's a different size yeah. on every single one of those models. So, you know, in some respects, there is some difference. I personally, I like the bounciness of like the 800 and the 1000 nib a little better. Mm -hmm but they only come on bigger pens. That's too big for Rachel. Um, and they're a little weightier too. So the M600 still has, um, it doesn't have as many metal components inside like the, the piston mechanism. So it's a little lighter. The overall pen's a little smaller. So it's a perfect pen for her hand. And so she loves it. So I have used a bunch of hers and I've bought a couple of mine as well because they'll do like special editions every now and then only in a particular model size. They've done some in the M600 that I've really liked. So. I picked up a couple myself and uh, because I've had really good experience with her broads, that's kind of what I defaulted to as well. So it's just one of the smoothest uh, nibs that I've ever used. Um, and another one to go with another German brand, uh, Lamy has their 14K nibs, not the Lamy 2000 nib, though they are smooth, especially on the medium and the broad and double broad too, which is like, whoa, hey now, can't always find those, but they're, it's like a bucking Bronco riding on the thing. Um, but the the regular 14K nibs that they have on some of the higher end, like Studios, the Emporium, the Dialog CC, Dialog 3, those nibs, that's like the same, you know, paperclip style. Not paper, no, that's not paperclip. The, the like changeable, what am I talking about? Staple. Staple ones, yeah. The ones that like have the wings that fold over and you can slide them on and off. Um, they make that in a 14K gold one. Those in a medium or broad especially, they are very, very smooth. And, and gushers. Gushers. The broad especially is like, holy freaking crap. This thing is like just going to shoot ink out of the pen like off the page yeah, like because it's so much gushing. Um, those are some of my favorites. I've used a lot of other smooth nibs, but those ones like in particular stand out to me. The first one that comes to my head is the Medium Lamy 2000. I'm sure that it's okay. not as smooth as the broad um, just because of the, the shape and the size, but yeah. I remember writing with a, like the first time I wrote with a medium 2000 nib was mm. like a life altering moment where yeah. I was like, I stopped. Like it, it stopped me in my tracks. I, wow. I wrote with it and I stopped. Like it's kind of like, like had a moment eating there. a bite of food and just kind of like putting your fork down and just like, <laughs> hold on, what's in my mouth? Right. Like <laughs> it, it was it was a shock to me. Yeah. So I'm, I've probably written with smoother nibs since then, mm. but like the impact it had on right. you was last. I was that yeah. at that moment I was blown away at how smooth fountain pen nibs could potentially be. Mm. Like that was jarring in yeah. the best of ways. So for me, medium two thousand comes to mind. 
And like Brian said, the medium and the broad 2000 are very, very smooth nibs. Yeah. And they're very uniquely shaped too. They almost have mm -hmm. a stub shaped to them. The tipping yeah, material yeah. is almost like a soft rectangle. It's very weird. Yeah, the, Lamy, the whole Lamy 2000s in general, it's kind of like the grinds are in kind of like their own league. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, let's see. It is, uh, let's see. Um, if you want to look at a video about Lamy 2000 nibs, It'll be right here if I can remember to add it. <laughs> Are you making note of the time? Yeah. Nice. Because um, it is, you're right. Um, it is It is complicated. But, you know, you yeah. do have a very comprehensive video on it, Brian. So good job. Thanks. Um, and then one of the nibs I currently have has a Yovo gold nib in double broad on it. Oh, yeah. Those are really smooth. That one is, oh, it'll get away from you. Yeah. It just wants to go. Even the broads, they're very gushy. You yeah. don't see them on a lot of pens because they are very expensive. So yeah. it really increases the cost. Like Diplomat has like the Nexus. They have a steel nib version and a gold nib version, but it's a significant yeah. jump in price. So not a lot of people go for it, but you can this get that This is an broad. Edison, an Edison uh, Yovo double yeah. broad. And it just phew, goes, man. It, yeah. is, it, is, it is fun to write with. Mm. So. Love it. Yep. Cool. Um, I should come as no surprise to you that we've named a bunch of German nibs. Uh, they love their that's, wet, smooth that's nibs. Just, <laughs> that's just wet, how broad, it goes. Smooth yeah. nibs. That's how they go, man. It's just, yep. yeah, just like the, the the Japanese pens have great, like, extra fines and soft nibs and all that. You know, they got their wheelhouse. Yep. Cool. Well, um, if you all have any opinions, too, I'd love to know what are some of the smoothest nibs you've written with. So drop it down in the comments. We can share with each other. All right. <clears throat> Chris R. says, I'm fairly new to fountain pens. In the span of a few months, I started with the Pilot Metropolitan as a tryout and was intrigued enough to go for a Twisby Eco and fell in love. Along the way, your back catalog of podcasts has been a wealth of information that informed me every step of the way. Glad to hear that. And I've enjoyed taking them in because of the character you both bring to the show. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, that's... That's what Chris said. Thank you so much. Anyway, question. What are the Pokemon starters of fountain pens? I'd be happy to see what arbitrary rules you may add, but if it helps, I'm thinking mainly of a rock, paper, scissors dynamic and one of you filling in as the professors bestowing that critical first choice. Drew, this feels like in your wheelhouse here. Are well, you a big I, Pokemon I was, guy? Uh, I played the first one. Okay. I played the first Pokemon on my Game Boy Pocket on okay. the school bus. I want to say 96, 90, yeah, I think 96. I had just started middle school, I think. Mm. Anyway, um, yeah, my black Game Boy Pocket. I had Pokemon Blue. Nice. Um, since then, I have only ever played the Pokemon Snap games, which are mm. not like, I, I look at them fondly. You just like, you're in a cart and you just roll around and take pictures of Pokemon. You don't even catch anything. Okay. You don't battle anything. You can't die. Wow. You can't get hurt. Okay. It's like my chill, happy place game. Hey, we've all got those. Yeah. It's like reading like in a young adult novel when you just don't want to read anything. You're just like, you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to challenge myself right now. Yeah. So I'm a fan of those. I get it. But yeah, I do at least know what they're talking about here as far as starters go. Because when you start a Pokemon game, you're usually presented with the choice of three Pokemon. Mm. You can either choose a Water Pokemon, a Fire Pokemon, or an Earth Pokemon. Okay. And Fire beats Earth. Earth beats oh. Water and water beats fire. So it's kind of a okay. rock, paper, scissors thing. So that's what they're getting at here. This is helpful for me to know because yeah. I've never played I'm sure anything. a lot of people don't know. My kids talk at me about Pokemon yeah. things, but it's not in such a presentable, structured fashion as what you have just said to me. <laughs> so normally it's spouting off yes. stats of random things and I'm just like, yeah. what are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah, you're lucky with <laughs> kids if you even if they even tell you what they're thinking of before they start talking at oh, you. Oh yeah, no, it's rare. They're just like, yeah, and he was doing this thing on this. I'm like, who, what? Yeah. Oh, Steven Universe. I'm like, how did I know that you were talking? Right, anyway. right, yep. <laughs> okay, so starter Pokemon number one is going to be a Lamy Safari and its ability is durability. Mm. Uh, starter number two is the Twisby Eco and its element is capacity. Mm. Starter number three is the Pilot Metropolitan mm. and the uh, ability there, or the element is writing consistency. Mm -hmm. So pretty much no brainers there as far as the Safari, the Eco, and the Metro. Yeah, we talk you know. about them all the time. Yeah, so no surprises there. But yeah. the rock, paper, scissors thing was a challenge to me. And mm. I appreciate the rules because that that that's fun. Arbitrary rules is Drew's like I love modus operandi. I love it. Let's go. <laughs> so um, 
the Safari having its durability uh, victory there is going to be um, strong um, versus capacity because it does it is tougher than the Eco for sure. Um, it is weak, however, um, against consistency mm -hmm. because as much as I love the Safari, the interchangeable nibs, an extra fine versus an extra fine versus an extra fine, you're not going to get that level of consistency that you will get from the Metropolitan. So strong versus capacity, weak versus consistency. Moving on to the Twisby Eco, its ability, as we remember, is capacity. So this one is going to be strong versus consistency um, for, uh, you know, um, because the consistency pen, the Metro, has an abysmal converter in the Con40. So uh, not capacity strong, that one. No. So it is so going much. to, if in, so in a rock, paper, scissors battle, it's going to win against capacity. However, it is weak against durability because the uh, the Eco is not nearly as strong as the Safari. You leave that thing outside, pretty much say bye-bye to it. You leave a Safari outside, it'll be fine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, wipe it off, go to, go to town. <laughs> and then the Metropolitan, our last starter Pokemon, um, its ability is consistency, riding consistency. Pilot definitely is able to do that. Um, the Metropolitan is going to be strong versus durability um, for no particular reason, I don't think. You know, I can't be perfect here, but definitely weak uh, versus capacity because it has a very tiny converter. Um, but, uh, and oh no, it's strong against durability because durability is the Safari of which is the least consistent in terms of writing consistency uh, of the three that we're talking about here. So that was the logic that I applied. I'm pretty comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's it, yeah. Um, I would, uh, if I were starting off and um, Professor Oak, you know, gave me a choice between these three, I think that I am going with the Safari. That's not too far from where I began with the All-Star being my first fountain pen. I feel like that was a good place to start. I felt like uh, I didn't, I wasn't afraid to use it. It didn't intimidate me at all. I didn't feel like I was using something fragile or um, something I shouldn't have, like, mm. oh, this is too fancy. I wasn't afraid to use it. Mm. Um, it just felt good. It felt like a good pen to begin my journey with. And then mm. I uh, embarked and I wasn't, I'm not trying to catch them all, but I caught a, caught a few, <laughs> got a pretty good one. So what, what would like be your, uh, what would be your starter <sighs> poke pen? I mean, you can't go wrong with any of them, honestly. Um, I feel like the Metropolitan probably would have been you know, it's mm -hmm. hard for me to put myself back in a place of like being in a starter starter type position, but Metropolitan would do it for me. Just mm -hmm. the metal, the metalness of it, yeah, just speaks to like durability, and I can be hard on my pen sometimes. And that nib is super consistent. It is. It's, it's really a, it's good. a performer. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I like it. All right, so yeah. please, it's a simple question, y'all. Which Poke pen are you starting your journey with in your in your journey to collect them all to fill out your pen decks? There you go. All right. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Chris, that was a fun one. Thank you for the education, Drew, on You're how very welcome. Pokemon works. Yeah. Thank you for the absolute most basic explanation. I believe <laughs> Pokemon. I believe we might talk about Pokemon with Micah today as well. Oh, really? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. Final question. Number five comes to us from both Robert and Valerie asking mm. some similar questions today. Okay. Robert says, My wife loves slender pens. Unfortunately, most fountain pens are relatively girthy. Mm -hmm. What are some good options? For the most slender pens available. Okay. Likewise, Valerie, which probably is not Robert's wife, but that would be funny, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> what are the best fountain pens for medium and smaller hands? Even mm. guidelines would help. I hate buying a pen and having it feel like I'm holding a rolling pen. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you should not get the Mag 1000. Let no. me tell you that much, uh, Valerie. That's not the pen for you. Mm -mm. Um, okay, slender pens. Uh, you're right. I, I think that's, for me, one of the things coming into the fountain pen world was like there's a whole different baseline of what is like a small medium and large pen and it's like you know it's like if you go to i don't know if i don't have a good analogy for it but you, you have to get a whole different framework in mind in terms of pen size a lot of that has to do with just like the mechanisms inside like you have the feed you have um you know the the ink reservoir all that, like if there's a piston or cartridge, or whatever, there's just a lot of extra stuff in there that you have to fit versus a ballpoint or a roller ball that's just going to be like some thin stick. metal yeah. or thin plastic. And there's a little stick in there with a 
ball at the end. So um, yeah, just inherently fountain pens are going to be girthier. So, but that's not necessarily a problem. I think actually the, I mean, I could be wrong, but for most people, the girth of a pen is actually not the most obtrusive part of using, um, you know, a big pen. Uh, and this is, I have to, I have to go off of what other people tell me because I have big hands. Uh, I have not experienced this for myself so much unless I'm holding the absolute largest of pens. And then I'm like, oh, this pen actually feels kind of big in my hand. For me, it's usually the opposite. Everything feels small. Um, but for those who have had smaller hands, it's not that they don't necessarily like girthier pens. It's that it often is coupled with increased weight or increased length of the pen. You know, so that, that I think is actually more of the issue. A lot of it depends on like how you grip your pen. You know, if you have like a four finger grip, like Rachel, she doesn't like thin pens because, and she's relatively small hands, but she needs a girthier pen just because of the way she grips her pen. So she actually likes pens that are like the mid size. She uses her whole hand. She's, she's as many fingers <laughs> as she, um, she, she uses as many fingers as she possibly can almost. She doesn't use her pinky, but if she could, maybe she would. Um, that'd be kind of weird to try right. Anyway, so uh, I think the, the, the grip diameter has a little bit to do with it, but I don't know, maybe it's a preference thing. But I th so if you look on our website, kind of what I used to narrow down my options in terms of pens, we have a lot of filters built on our site, not for like every single dimension, but we do have one for grip diameter. And it has a little like range that you can set. Now, if you have no baseline whatsoever, you're like, I don't know what an 8.6 millimeter grip is, Take a pen that you have, ideally a fountain pen that's like something we have listed on our site. Use that as your baseline. So say you have a Lamy Safari, whatever. Go look up that pen and see what the grip dimension is for that pen. And then you can set the range kind of near that if you really like it. And then it'll only show you pens that have that approximate grip size. Now, the one caveat I'll say about that is a lot of grips have tapers or contours or something like that. Like the Lamy Safari. <laughs> like the, well, the Safari is not as bad, but like a Lamy 2000, for example, that thing oh, tapers oh. real hard. I was thinking about the notches for the fingers. It, so that gets complicated too, where, you know, so it's like, uh, you know, that's hard, but we try our best to approximate about what the dimension is. So that's why it's, you know, don't hold on too tightly to that, but it'll at least give you a pretty good idea of what you're going for. So um, generally speaking, pens with smaller grips tend to be more in the slender size. We don't have a filter on our site for diameter of the body of the pen, but we do have the dimension of the body of the pen uh, in diameter on every single product. So if you can narrow it down by grip size in the overall, you know, uh, whatever filter, and then the pens that you find more appealing, you can click in and you can see what the actual like diameter is of the body. So that's that's the best way we have to go about it and sort of us, you know, you kind of looking it up on your own. Um, but I will recommend some pens that I have used that I think are more on the slender side that I could easily recommend. Um, and Drew threw some at me too. So I'm going to give him some credit for coming up with these. We'll just say we work together on these. How about that? So starting off with strictly slender pens, which I think can be somewhat different than pens for medium or smaller hands because I know a lot of people have medium, smaller hands that don't necessarily want slender pens. So I'm gonna kind of split them up into two different answers. So slender pens, um, one I have is the Traveler's Brass Pen. It's a little pocket pen, super thin, super thin grip on that one. Um, I really like it a lot. And it's cause it's brass. So you can have like very thin walls on that thing. Um, but you know, it's not gonna be a pen for everybody cause it's like very, very short. It's kind of like the Coeco Lilliput, which also is a good one to consider too. But those are like truly like pocket pens. Yeah. So very handy in a lot of circumstances, but they are very, very thin. So you can check those out. Um, the, uh, I had the Noodler's, Noodler's Nib Creeper. That thing is surprisingly thin as it well. It is, it's very thin. It's a flex nib, so it's not gonna be for everybody. It's a weird nib. But it's a thin pen. But and you don't very, have to flex very, it. You don't have to flex it. And it's very light too. So that's an option. It's also really inexpensive. Just set it outside for a week before you use it. It's gonna have an, uh, an essence to it. Yeah. Um, the Sailor High Ace Neo. Now oh, only, yeah. yeah it Good only has, one. It's very light, very thin, but it only has stub nibs. So you have to kind of want a stub. They're good stub nibs, though. They're I really love good. That pen. They're great writing pens for the money. Yeah. They don't necessarily get the love that I feel that they should. No, they're underrated for sure. Yeah, but they're definitely worth considering. Um, the Diplomat Traveler. 
This one's kind of a sleeper. We don't have it in a lot of things. Do we still sell that? We have it in the uh, like the fired version of it. Do we really? Yeah, we do. Oh, interesting. We do. I forget so, about that one. A lot of people forget about it. Yeah. It's a decent pen. It's not like everybody's favorite, but it's pretty decent and uh, it's a little on the thinner side. So you can check that out. Um, the Waldman Tango Imagination. This is a little more on the uh, like more premium end, mm -hmm. um, but it's a relatively thinner pen as well. And this one looks a little fancier than all the ones I've mentioned so far. It's a nice pen. Yeah. Um, I have the Lamy Safari on here. The, you know, this one is weird because it's kind of a triangular grip. It tapers a little bit. Um, and the, I don't know if the body would considered be considered slim because it does get a little girthier in the body and the cap. But if it's really more about how the grip feels, um, the grip, I think, to me, feels a little smaller even then like the dimension itself gives because if you're holding it in a triangular fashion, you're actually holding like sort of a smaller part of it than the overall diameter of the grip would uh, present. So that one's worth a look. Uh, the most obvious one I think is probably the Lamy CP1. That whole pen is really thin. It's like a little tube, looks like a straw. Um, and that one I've talked about here many times as not being a pen that I particularly love to write with because it's so thin, but might be perfect for you, I don't know. Um, Diplomat Magnum, that one is thin and has triangular grip. And it's very light. And it's very light. It's it's like really, really kind of accomplishes everything. And it's pretty affordable too. Yeah. Um, and a decent nib too, surprisingly bouncy for a steel nib. So that one's worth a look and they have some cool colors. Uh, the Pilot Explorer, I know you're a big fan of the Explorer. That's another one that's thin and light. Thin and light, yep. And I think the lightness too, that's when we get into more like the medium and smaller kind of thing that that really comes into play. Uh, I mentioned the Quaker Lily put already and that's everything I had for that one, okay? So I didn't have like a hard rule, but I when I was doing my filter on the website, I was looking at something like in the 8.6 to 8.7 millimeter diameter size for the grip and smaller. And you get some decent options on there. Um, and then for smaller or medium hands, so I do have like an approach to sort of talk about and then a couple of pens to mention. So I think the best approach is to look at the grip diameter, kind of like what I just mentioned, um, comparing a pen that you already have if possible. Um, you can check out the body diameter and the body length. Again, none of this will make a whole lot of difference to you unless you have a pen to compare it to. So it's most helpful if you have a pen that we have on our website that we've done the dimensions for so that you can then extract those dimensions and then map them to other pens. And we have a comparison feature too, where you can pull up multiple pens and compare more than one pen That's at what time. I was gonna mention. Yeah, use yeah. the pen plaza on our website under comparison yeah. tools. You can see any pen on our website side by side next to each other. We use the same format mm -hmm. so that you will see a one-to-one -one ratio yeah. of pen to pen. So you can see exactly how big. So find a pen that you know mm -hmm. you like, you can compare it right next to a pr prospective pen. So that's a really good one, but if you, um, so there's another, that's like under our comparison tools, but there is like a compare checkbox that you can click and it'll like pull up the, the, like the stats on the pen and compare them as well. I don't know if it does every single technical spec. I don't know. I should have looked that up, but whatever. We have lots of options for you to slice and dice it. Um, so the most important thing is just map a pen that you like and find something similar. Um, and then consider the overall weight. So the overall weight I think is gonna make a big difference into how like big and heavy a pen feels. Uh, I There's no like one specific number that's perfect, but I think anything under 20 grams, I would probably consider to be like a generally lighter pen. And 20 grams could be just in the body of the pen. If it's a pen that's longer, I'm thinking like a Lamy Safari. Um, you know, the that whole pen is pretty light. I think it's like 17 grams with the cap. So that one you can post it and everything and it's still pretty light. But if you didn't post it, I think it's like 12 grams in the body. Much lighter. That's really friggin' light. So even if you got a slightly heavier pen, but it was long, the body was long enough that you didn't post it, you know, if you're under 20 grams on that body, it's still gonna feel fairly light. So I think um, you'll be okay. Just kind of use that maybe as a number to start with. Um, what's ideal for everybody is gonna vary a lot, but if you have pens you know you like, finding comparables is really gonna go a long way. So, I mean, everything I mentioned already, pen-wise, I think, could definitely be suitable for somebody with smaller hands. Um, but some other good ones to consider that we haven't quite talked about, maybe because the grip is just a little bit bigger. Um, any of the Quakos, like the Quaco Sports, you know, even like the All Sports, those are aluminum. They're not that heavy. No. If you have like a brass or a stainless steel one, those get a little weightier, but they're still pretty small pens. So those are worth a look. Um, I think the Pilot E95S is great. Anything that's light like that, even like a Lamy 2000, like it's got a tapered grip, 
they don't feel quite as girthy as some of the ones that are just like big straight tubes. Yeah, especially if you choke up on it. Yeah, so if you have smaller hands. Go right to the end. Yeah, I'm thinking like a Lamy 2000. You can you can hold closer to the end and it'll feel a lot smaller. Um, and then uh, Edison pens actually comes up a lot because they're very, very light for their size. They, are. they tend to be a little bit bigger pens, but a lot of people, especially if they have, um, I hear this a lot with things like the Collier and stuff like that, that people actually like the big weight, or sorry, the big, uh, the big like diameter of the pen mm -hmm. because they don't have to grip it as tightly. So that that's something to consider too. It's maybe not always about the diameter, but the overall weight's really low. So that one's worth a look. Um, and then kind of anything similar to that size. So there you go. That's what I got right now. I completely agree. And I really like the addition of some of those. Like I, I totally forgot about the high ace Neo. I yeah. have told people that it's underrated and yet I am yeah. well, look, I, looking over it. It wasn't top of mind for me in this context until I did like the filter thing and I saw it and I was like, oh yeah, that yeah. is really thin. Of course. You know? And I totally forgot we even sold the traveler. So yeah. So there you go. That one can fly under too. Indeed. So hopefully you got some good recommendations there. Um, that's all the Q&A questions that we have for this week. But if you got some more questions for us, especially if you're an audio listener, email us at pencast at goulaypens.com. Otherwise you can drop comments down on the YouTube video, whatever, we'll get them, we'll keep talking. Um, okay, Drew, I think it's now time for meeting Micah, right? So uh, yeah, let's insert that here and we'll see you in a minute. Hello everybody. I'm here with Micah. Micah, say hello to PenCast people. Hi, PenCast people. There you go. There we go. Let's oh, bring that a little bit yeah, closer. Yeah. yeah. See, this is an intimate. Hear my sultry voice. Yes. This is this is <laughs> this is intimate and casual. I've got Micah here. He's my pal. He works over in the receiving area of the warehouse, and he's here to talk to us about Micah. <laughs> so arguably one of the things I know about the best. Yes. Well, that's good. Very very self reflective of you. I wish that everybody was. <laughs> As self-aware as you are, Micah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna put that to the test. Find out how much you know about you. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Ah! All right, Micah. I kind of spoiled this, but what is your job <laughs> at the Goulet Pen Company? Uh, I work in receiving. Hey. Um, I get boxes in and take stuff out of boxes and then put them in smaller boxes so that people can come to those boxes and take them out of those boxes and then put them into other boxes so they can be sent to you. That's the very simple way <laughs> to say it. I have seen you on days where things are not boring and there's more that goes on than just that. If you did just that, you would not, you, you'd you have more energy, I think. Because <laughs> so I've, I've seen you pretty wiped. Yeah, uh, so, I, I also do a little bit of warehouse management. Yes. Um, any random projects that come up sometimes. I would, I would say our warehouse is very well managed. I try. I think it, it's 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 pretty good. Everything is labeled, organized by. All right, so you've got a an aisle, a bay, no, aisle. Where yeah, the, we, where, where are the shelving units referred to as? Not a, not a shelf. It's actually we we constantly are like, oh, it's on the shelf. Well, not like the the shelf. The shelf shelf. But the, like but like the shelf. The thing that the shelves are on. So I normally try to say like the aisle, the shelving unit. Okay, the unit. The okay. shelf it's on, and then like the location on the shelf okay honestly. well it's good to know okay so you're you also have a hard time with that because i always don't know what to say it's the shelf and then the shelves on the shelf yeah <laughs> okay good all right not just me um where'd you work for before the goulet pen company and how long have you been here um so i have been here for eight and a half years God. now um crazy uh and before this i worked at a children's swim school Oh, that's right. I didn't actually teach kids. I, I just did like office I stuff. I forgot about that. I remember that now. Yeah, it was very interesting and, and pretty fun. Wow. Huh. That is really interesting. Yeah, I got to got to meet a lot of really cool families. The uh, old uh, Richmond celebrity, Shaka Smart. He was the VCU oh, basketball yeah, coach yeah, yeah. in, I don't know, whatever, 2014. I remember. Um, but his daughter came, so I got had had a little bit of Richmond royalty. There we go. Um, I mean, with VCU basketball, that's about as royalty as it gets around here. Yeah, well, until he left, and then yeah. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Uh, let's talk fountain pens a little bit because you you it is not a requirement that mm -hmm. everybody here like fountain pens, and a lot of time we have people that just don't care. You know, they're they're yeah. they, they do the job, they like the company, but fountain pens are not their thing. 
you actually do enjoy fountain pens and you also enjoy ink. Yeah. Do you have a favorite pen or favorite ink that uh, pops in your brain? Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm kind of basic when it comes to pens. That's I mean, th- right. there are a lot of pens that I really like out there that I don't necessarily own because, you know, they're expensive. But I, I mean, I just love a Twisby Eco. Oh, yeah. Just old, reliable, big ink capacity, interesting colors. It's, it's really just, yeah, it, it's just old faithful. It looks good. It's sleek. It's I feel like it's a very like impressive pen too for people who don't necessarily know pens. Who'd be like, oh yeah, this is a fountain pen. They're like, because you can see it sloshing and stuff. Yeah, that is cool. Um, big fan of the Eco. Um, I have a handful of them. Um, nice. And then as far as ink goes, um, I often kind of oscillate between Noodler's Fox, just because I feel like there's not a lot of uh, inks out there. Like I, I really like the Eternals for like their kind of matte quality. Yeah, those that are kind of those are kind of weird. That yeah, it's it, everything else is like very kind of I don't know translucent. Yeah, the like eternal a, inks are kind of like paint almost. Yeah, so I, I really like that. I like the the color of it, and then I'm also a big fan of um, Noodler's uh, Blue Nose Bear. It's also just like a very interesting ink that I don't feel like there's a lot of colors that are like it. It's got some really good shading. Um, so big big, big Noodler's fan over interesting, the years. Interesting, interesting. Blue Nose Bear is a. Uh... That, that's a that's a sleeper. It is. I I actually think that many a moon ago we did an underrated inks video, and I'm almost certain that I picked oh. Blue Nose Bear for it. Okay, you know what? <laughs> that 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 is that is interesting, but it's not. It's very Micah. That's a very Micah answer. Um, speaking of Micah things, I want to talk about hobbies. Okay. You you have some hobbies. Oh, I have some hobbies. You have some hobbies. I want to know what is your oldest hobby? The hobby you had. The longest that is that you still maintain as a as a hobby, uh, probably Pokemon in Yo, a lot of different duh. forms. You know, it came out. I think uh, Red and Blue came out in nineteen ninety five or ninety six. So I was a few years old at that point. Um, and so yes, uh, played Pokemon Blue on a old brick Game Boy. That was and, the one I had. Really enjoyed it, um, and yeah, I, I, at this point, I have played all of the games, um, most of the spinoffs. And you are a water type guy all the way, right? Water starter. I, my favorite type overall is ghost. Okay. Huge ghost type fan. But, but you always start with water. Team water starter always. Right. Same. Um, and so yes, big big fan of Pokemon. I, I collect the cards. Um, I uh, yeah played all the games. Honestly, I could probably name just about any Pokemon from any generation. Can you name the original 150? Oh, yeah, that's, well, I mean, come on. That's, <laughs> that's, that's hard. Do you know how many times they've remade the first generation? Come on. I, I don't know if I could name them all off the top of my head, like in order, but. No, not in order, but like, could could you could you get all 150? Oh, for sure. All right, we might I need feel, to put. <laughs> we'll put it to the test. We all. might need to. We might need to. Um, all right. What about a conversation topic that if it's going on and you're you're just you're just having your lunch, you're just chilling, but then you hear somebody start talking about something, normally you wouldn't jump in, but if they start talking about this thing, you're gonna jump in. What is it? Oh, here's the thing. It's probably gonna be a most stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I have ADHD brain, so you're being self aware again, yes. Micah. Look at this. You know Micah very well. This is yeah. well done. Yeah, I, I, there, there are a lot of things that I, I, I would consider myself like just a naturally curious person. You are, and you so definitely are. All the time, my, my wife hates it that like we'll be talking about something like, oh, I wonder about this, and I'm like, I feel like that's got to have happened, and I'll immediately pull out my phone and start googling it because I'm interested. And she's like, I, I just wanted to speculate. I'm like, I, I just, I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. Um, so yeah, I. <laughs> I probably uh, would butt into conversations way more than I should. <laughs> you know what? You know what I will say about you is that yes, you definitely do that, and I do that too. But you, rather than me, you're a much better listener than I am. Me, I just want to talk. You, as much as you do want to engage into the conversation, you will listen for as long as it takes. I, I, I think that you, you owe yourself some credit for that too, because a lot of people who like to interject are very bad at just waiting and listening to the other person. You're very good at that. I, I like that about you. Thanks. Thumbs up to Micah. Um, all right. Uh, if you could have three unlimited condiments, I think I, pro- I might have asked you this before, three unlimited condiments that could like come out of your fingers at any time. So wherever you are, you've got 
some sort of topping that you could just go and put onto your uh, food items. Maybe some that aren't always available to you. Mm -hmm. What would they be? Three. Um, so what, for one, that makes me think of like those like utter condiment machines yeah. that were in schools yep. that were like, oh. I think they used to have them at Costco too. Disgusting. <laughs> they were weird. <laughs> I think we had them in my school too. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of dietary restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are a few sauces that I can have either so, because they, they have dairy in them or, right. or gluten or just like they don't agree with me. So my faithful companion over my last few years of figuring out weird dietary stuff has been Chick-fil-A sauce. There we go. Chick-fil-A sauces are gluten-free. Boom. And I don't know, there's something about it that apparently my body handles it very well. Nice. So I go through a lot of it. There we go. So you order the big bottle? Yep, we get the we get the big bottle from nice. from you know the grocery store and yeah I I put it on just about oh, everything. I've done that with uh, Arby's horsey sauce. I have a big bottle of that. Uh, I've also yeah. gotten a big bottle of Taco Bell fire sauce, but it's not the same. Mm. It's not this. It's not yeah. as spicy. It's weaker than the packets. Huh. So then I just started hoarding the packets. Um. So Chick Fil A sauce for sure. Okay. There's one. Um. Probably just like some sort of like like Duke's mayo can't go wrong with dukes just you know i mean mayonnaise is always just good to have around um and then is it, your wife a dukes purist like mine is because we can't have anything but dukes in the house she gets very she's very particular about that i think she normally gets dukes but honestly she doesn't really eat a whole lot of mayonnaise okay. it's normally like if it's in like a recipe or something if i tried to bring hellman's into the house shannon would leave me here's the thing and i know i can feel the comments already i'm actually more of a miracle whip man myself. oh <laughs> I, I thought you were about to say Hellman's. You went to Miracle Whip. I I like both. I, I I'm I'm very happy to eat both, but I I, I really like the Miracle tangy Whip. zip. I like it. It's, it's wow. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I I, uh, I apologize in advance. Oh, that's I've never had Miracle Whip, so I'm not gonna hate on it. It's. I mean, I don't I'll know. I'll try it and then I'll hate on it. If you're if you're <laughs> if you're considering it like a one to one mayonnaise substitute, you you'll probably be disappointed. But it's more of just like a dressing. Mm. Um. And then the last one, this is, so this isn't going to be a traditional condiment pick. Um, Trader Joe's has a vegan tzatziki dip Ooh. that I can eat and is shockingly good. A lot of dairy-free stuff ends up like, I don't know, having a weird taste or just like not quite being the substitute. But this has like the tang that you want from a good tzatziki. Um, and so, yeah. It sounds like that. I think tang is the common denominator in your... Sauces here, Micah. You're a tangy, you're a tangy man. I'm a tangy guy. Tangy man, what Micah. What can I say? All right. Uh, do you have a favorite place to vacation or visit? Um, I love aquariums. So oh. it's not necessarily like oh, one yeah. particular place. Um, really, I would never think that about you looking at your arm. <laughs> <laughs> All the sea creatures on He's my got arm. a full sleeve of sea creatures. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I love aquariums. Um, I have yet to go to the Georgia Aquarium, which is apparently the best one. They have like a, a, a wave pool that has a uh, a whale shark in it, like a whole whale shark. Not a half a whale shark. Not a half Dang. a whale shark. Dang. Yeah. So All that's, right. that's crazy. They sprung for that full whale shark. Um, yeah. So I, I tend to like cities more than places. And, and if it's got to be somewhere in nature, generally mountains. So, so far, what's your favorite aquarium? Ooh. Um, so I, I love this one, not necessarily because it's the best aquarium I've been to, but the Roanoke Island Aquarium in, uh, Outer Banks. Yeah. Uh, on, it's like on, on Roanoke Island, the south side of, of the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Is that near Manio? It is. Yep. It's, I've been there. I've been it's there. It's kind of back in behind Manio. I've been there. They've got a sea turtle bronze statue out back. They do. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. They always have some cool outdoor exhibit a lot for a, a few years. It was like dinosaurs. Um, and yeah, it's just a really cool, small little aquarium, but it, they, it, I don't know. It always just feels very homey yeah. in there. It's not like the chaos of going to like the national aquarium or, um, something like that. Um, it's, yeah, all, it's, it's down like, you know, a, a down a, a residential road. Yeah. It's, and it's just kind of tucked back in there. It's like basically like in a field. Like yeah. it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. I remember. Yeah. I've only been there once, but it was delightful. I will say also the Monterey Bay Aquarium was oh. very neat just because they had a giant uh, Pacific octopus. And so, I mean, he was like up against the glass and it was like, I mean, it must have been eight feet long, like, you know, from, from tip of arm to arm. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That is cool. Aquariums are awesome. All right. Um, do you have a favorite movie, Micah? 
Um, I have. I think my. I mean, my. If if I had to like end up, just just one one. Uh, I think the Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh yeah. Um, I am. I love Christmas. Micah I, loves Christmas. I love Christmas. Do you listen to Christmas music all year round? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he does. He's not. He's not joking about Definitely. that. Definitely. No. Yeah. <laughs> um. And so I like. I, I. I also like the aesthetic of. Tim Burton movies been been in the metal scene for most of my life, so yeah. it, it feels like a marrying of two things that I really like. That's a perfect answer for you. I would say that that's a that's a very Micah movie. When I was in college, I used to um, put that movie on to write my papers because oh. I can't have quiet. Right, <laughs> and so I would put that on and I would just write papers and to to uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Did all of your letters have like weird curly? you know, serifs around them. Yeah. It was it looks like that episode of SpongeBob where he spends 45 minutes creating one letter. I haven't seen that one, but that makes sense. <laughs> You're too old for SpongeBob. I, yeah, I, I kind of I kind of miss SpongeBob. Um I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you your favorite type of music because that leads me into my Micah specific questions. Okay. We'll wait on. Because you are the person I know who most often goes to concerts, if that sentence makes any sense. You are a concert going fool. Yeah. And you are a live music appreciator. Mm-hmm. What is the deal? Like at this point, like in your life, you have been to so many live shows and you've been to so many repeated live shows of the same bands over and over and over again. What draws you to that experience and what continues to be, you know, alluring? in for the live experience man that's a really good question i mean for me like i see one band i'm done i'm like all right there you go Just cross mm-hmm. that off I'm, I'm good they're gonna probably do similar next time like i'm good there are definitely plenty of shows that i've gone to where i liked like one of the openers but i didn't like the headliner mm-hmm. and so i would just go and watch the openers and then leave <laughs> because i didn't really want to see that that's the thing um i mean i i think i think it fundamentally comes down to um I don't know how many of you have been to a, a metal show, a he- heavy music show, or, or any any kind of genre that um, at least comes across as like aggressive in nature. There, there's an experience there that you just can't really find anywhere else. And the best way I've been able to describe it to people in the past is consensual aggression. It's like a it's like an opportunity for um, these people who feel very deeply and and feel anger or disappointment or you know some some sort of hurt and it it's all these people together who have these similar experiences and feelings and they just want to like get it all out together it's it's not it's it's like um i i don't remember who said it but it's like people people don't listen to sad music to feel sad right. people listen to sad music to to feel like they're not alone right it's an empathetic sort of thing yeah and so it's this yeah, it's, it's it, therapeutic it is yeah it, it, and you just can't really get that experience anywhere else um, where you have all these people who who share these similar experiences or similar emotions and and want to kind of like work through them all together yeah um cuz i guess you could listen to sad music and have a good cry by yourself but to get out some anger and some frustration or some, uh, you know, you know, aggression, you can't really do that just by yourself. Like I, you could run real hard, I guess. Like, but yeah, I, I can understand that. It's it's kind of like a community uh, therapy session. It is, yeah, I mean, like think about like you know, you're in your car singing your favorite song, and it's it's so exciting. Now imagine doing that with like 200 people. Yeah, all singing your favorite song and just like having having the time of your life, um, and. All these bands are are generally fun. They, yeah. you know, people are going crazy. So it, it's just, I, yeah. There, there's something very communal and like therapeutic about the live show experience. I can understand that. I, it terrifies me, and you know, I won't be doing it. But I can understand it. <laughs> but you know, but you also you don't go to see bands that you don't have like a true connection with. Every band you go see, from what I understand. You like you know the guys, you know their names, you know you've met a lot of them in real life. Like they, some of them even know you. Um, so let me switch it around a little bit. What is the most mainstream band that you really love, or the most like kind of guilty pleasure sort of band? Some not not anything that something that like everybody would know. Maybe, yeah. Maybe not something you're ashamed of, but like one that yeah. is they would they would have they would be playing behind a car commercial or something like that. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> or if you have any. Well, so so uh, I, I uh, mentioned to you earlier that I, I try not to have guilty pleasures in music, and because I feel like I spent so many years in high school and middle school just like hating bands and yeah. genres and stuff just on principle, realizing that there was so much good music over the years that like if I would have just set myself aside, I could have enjoyed it. Um, and so I, you know, that being said, my guilty pleasures are um, Ariana Grande. Yes. Love her. That's amazing. I will always listen to a new record. She I love out. how you're talking about like, yeah, sometimes you need, just need to get that communal aggression out. <laughs> but Ariana Grande, like that. <laughs> well, speaking of communal aggression, she was robbed when she put out Dangerous Woman and didn't. And that was the year that Adele won all of the Grammys for <laughs> that record. And so I'm, I'm still angry about that. Because that was a masterpiece. I love that. Um, and then uh, probably if I were to think of like one artist, I'm like, ah, this is probably my guiltiest pleasure is probably Drake. Uh-huh. And it's because like, I don't know, he, he's not that great of a rapper or not that great of a singer, but his production is very, very good. And listening to a lot of heavy textural music and playing percussion like I did, um, it, a lot of that is like atonal and textural. So I, I, have, I have a big affinity towards like, production and beats and and like more kind of the the feeling of music not necessarily like the melodic aspects of it nice i don't know if, i'm sure i've heard a drake song but if like if you played one for me i'd be able to said yes i've heard that but i can't i can't name any that's right he, he puts out like two 30 track albums a year so what? there's plenty plenty out that he oh, just wow. put out a record today does he sing like or is he raps he does a little of both. It's like kind of okay. the like auto tune thing, oh, okay. kind of like a like almost like a T Pain, but okay. honestly, T Pain's voice is better. So. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> shade. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Superheroes. Superheroes. You and I have had many comic based conversations over the years. You've both got funny and about superheroes. Yes, comedic <laughs> and superhero related. Um, like your bands, you do enjoy comic books that fly a little under the radar. Mm. As far as just a, like a stock standard superhero that most people would kind of have an understanding for, who who is your favorite superhero? Micah has some salty feelings about Batman, so we won't get into that. But the part, who who do you like? I won't do that to Jenea. That's <laughs> That would be too mean. Um, I mean, the only correct answer is Kyle Rayner, the Green Lantern. Yes! <laughs> I mean, come on, he's he's the best. He's the best. Yeah, and and Green Lantern, uh, it's just Jeff Johns taking it over in 2000. I won't get too nerdy. Because I I know you like Green Lantern. He's got some Green Lantern tattoos. Do. Uh, I I love Green Lantern, and I love the emotional spectrum. Yeah. Um, I like, yeah, the personification of different emotions with color. I I just, I think it's brilliant. Um, And there's so much story to be told in those. What do you think the Brown Lantern's emotion would be? (laughs) Uh... Whatever Trevor's personality <laughs> is, uh, Trevor's Trevor's Mike, Micah's partner in crime over in the receiving department. There, I, I think almost like uh, <laughs> what is Trevor's <laughs> primary personality? Uh, banjo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you ever seen? The, uh, I, I'm assuming you've seen Avatar: The Last Airbender. Uh, no. What? I have not. What? No. Oh, not the TV show, not the anime, uh, okay. or not the movie. I well, know it, I know there's a bald kid that has an arrow in his head and he can control uh, water? No, air. The air. Well, he's the avatar so he can control all. Anyway. Okay, I didn't know that. Oh my goodness. Sorry. Uh, well, there there is one episode of of Avatar where cuz the, the the two like water tribes are like in the pole at the poles, uh-huh. the North and South Pole, and they're kind of like uh, almost sort of like Eskimo sort of cultures, but there's an episode where they go into a swamp and they meet who who are they end up being called calling the swamp benders the brown lanterns <laughs> the brown the swamp benders <laughs> who they're water benders that bend the water inside of vines and so they control the swamps and stuff that way nice and that that's the brown lanterns nice like a I love swamp it. hillbilly <laughs> like if you, if you went like in a fjord in like uh in, in Florida I love that yeah. I love that With some like big <laughs> frayed straw hat and some overalls uh-huh. with no shirt on. Yep, love it. All right. Well, I don't think we're gonna get better than that. That that <laughs> that, that wins. All righty. Well, thank you for stopping by, Micah. Thank you for having me. Anytime. That was Micah. He's here. He will continue to be here for you if you decide to order from us at some point. Whatever you buy has probably been been touched by this man. So <laughs> that's that's yeah. All right. Thank you, Micah. 
All right. Well, thank you, Micah, wherever you are today. I've seen him. He's definitely <laughs> yep, here. He's around. Always a delight to talk to him. And uh, Micah has been in several videos in addition to the Right Now videos. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, perhaps some of you have been missing Micah. So you're welcome for some Micah. We'll have some more people <laughs> available i'm gonna probably sit down with some folks at the end of this week or next week nice. and um uh, we got to get Janea in here for sure oh, yeah. um, some of you might have seen oh, yeah. her on uh, some of our social media posts she's you know our new uh marketing team member here and uh, she's a delight so we'll need to get her in here and i'll probably get some customer care folks in here too maybe yeah that'd be great brian right? and Kay, hopefully yeah i think ethan said yes so uh That's great. Yeah. yeah so i've got i've got a bunch more people coming down the pipeline so if you've ever interacted with any of our customer care team hopefully you'll be meeting some of them here shortly awesome all right i believe it's time for the nonsensical portion of uh, our broadcast we're doing pretty decent on time drew so we got plenty of time to bs here we, we do we do <laughs> let's get into it with what's happening all right. Well, Brian, it's been a while. It has been a while. It's been a while. So I I'm had, literally like, what have you been up to? I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, I had the week off last week. Yeah. You know, I uh, took it off because I have too much PTO. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> I'm for like that. Drew. You you need to actually like leave this place. <laughs> I mean, I like being around you and whatnot. So but, yeah, I just yeah. I took the week. I did nothing. I stayed at home. I wow. did. I did the opposite of what you would do on a week off. Yeah, that's very true. One hundred percent. But before that. Um, we did have a weekend. I uh, told mm -hmm. our friends here that we had um, some in-laws visiting. So we took my wife's nephew and um, my son to a place called Kids Empire, which you've heard of. Yes, um, I heard about it from you. Yeah. And thus went there. So <laughs> I went there. Uh, it was you were in the nano, middle of you were a work. You were a nano influencer for me, Drew. There we go. <laughs> it was in the middle of the day, so no one was there. But it reminded awesome. me of Discovery Zone. I don't know if any of you ever heard of that. It was a thing in the early uh, mid '90s. Nineties, yeah. Um, and it, you know, I don't think they exist anymore. But it was a massive play area for kids. But adults is that are like a national thing, or is that more of a regional? I don't know. I have no idea. Hmm. But adults are encouraged to look stay uh, with their kids this whole time at this place kids empire so um i had to go with archer all up in it i mean i had to oh it's so terrible mm. but this thing was massive and i was there during a weekday where no one was there so i was on the slides i was climbing and falling and jumping and crashing and i thought it was going to be more sore than i was but i actually made it out pretty okay drew discovery zone went defunct in december of 2001 oh really it lasted that long yeah 90 98 to 2001 i think Wait, no, sorry, 89. I was about to say, it didn't. It was before 98. 1989 to okay. 2001. Wow, it hung in there. The one to one year us was gone before that, though. Oh, yeah. It yeah. didn't last that long, no. No. Um, so that was fun. I uh, There was this tall kind of tower. I think I want to say it was like maybe five levels of interwoven rubber straps or elastic straps. Yeah. And I think the idea is for you to start at the bottom and just kind of like, fall or tumble through to the bottom and or you can like try to climb up it but it's difficult yeah i don't know i don't know what's allowed but i was just falling through it and yeah i just went completely limp and just like hurled my body down it which feels wrong it feels like you would because you're like 30 feet in the air something like that like oh yeah, you're way up there it's pretty high i loved it <laughs> i loved it so much i was That's acting awesome. like such a goof and I had a great time. So. You acting like a goof? That's I know really it's hard surprising. to picture. Yeah, but I I fell down that thing probably ten times. It was exhilarating. So I did that. Um, we also uh, took Archer to see Frozen at uh, one of our local theaters. I think it was a landmark. Um, okay. And um, it was a big, you know, off Broadway sort of production. So a lot of really big effects. Cool. Beautiful singing. Um, some of them, some of the cast were the Broadway cast. So uh, that was a true spectacle the effects that they had for elsa's ice and everything like that was yeah. something i'd never foreseen on stage like That's they cool. did a lot of cool stuff a lot of projection work mm. um that really made the interaction fascinating to see so that was a lot of fun um and then i had a week off brian and yes. i basically sat around and watched movies like almost the entire time i watched nine movies wow um on monday i watched Watchmen, um, okay. which I think is 2009. Uh, and I loved the movie. I hadn't seen it in a while. And after that, I said to myself on Tuesday, I'm just going to keep doing this because it was so nice. Uh, I worked a lot on Archer's costume. 
as well. Yeah, so yeah. I would like, you know, Which take a looks break. Awesome, by the way. Yeah. So it I looks did unreal. I did finish the costume. I'll show you some pictures of that. Uh, I finally painted everything, added the straps and the elastic to the shoulder pads and whatnot. But um, yeah, I'm happy with it. It came out just the way I wanted it to. So it's really cool. All in all, it worked out. I've been working on it since July. Yeah, you really like started early. Yeah. It sounds like it was worth it. Yeah. yeah. So all in all, that, that that came together well. And right. tonight is Halloween, so we'll be taking it, it out. Um, yeah. It might get rained on, but you know, we'll see. Well, it's fine. We'll see. Yeah, it's all right. Um, so I watched Watchmen, and then I real, watched. Real quick, do you want to know how many Discovery Zones oh. there were in the peak? Uh, how many 89. locations? 300. Oh my God. Yeah. That's a lot. We're, uh, countrywide? I think so, All yeah. Right. Well, like, maybe you've heard of them. Blockbuster had invested a ton in them. But I would say Kids Empire is even better than DZ. Although less it's supervision. Hard to, it's hard to compare yeah. because nobody was, it was watching such a long, kids. It was such a long time ago. Yeah. That's probably the why they, they tell you to stay with your kids because they're not watching them at all. They aren't. Like, no, they, it's you, Lord you, of the Flies you, and those you, things. You sign a you. waiver and then they just go. They don't check. There's no signs. No. Nope. It's just like... I have a feeling it's going to get really nasty real quick because it's brand new yeah. in our area. It's nice and clean, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. How hard it must be to clean that facility. Oh, I can't imagine. Like, you got to crawl up in there and wipe everything down. Oh, yeah. There's no way they're doing that like There are lots of, lots of nooks and crannies. It's going to get so gross. Yeah. But anyway, it was new. It was great. <laughs> uh, we'll enjoy right. it while it's clean. <laughs> all right. So I don't know if you've seen any of these movies, but I'm going to tell you what I've watched, Brian. Right, I'll tell you. Watchmen. Nope. Aliens. No. Children of Men. Never heard of it. Copland. Nope. Ghostbusters Afterlife. Nope. The Mummy. I have seen The Mummy. There we go. Yeah, Brendan Fraser. Heck yeah. The Mask of Zorro. Is that the one with Catherine Zeta-Jones? Yes. I have seen that. hey -o. It was a while ago. Cowboys and Aliens. Haven't seen that. The Last Samurai. I have seen Last Samurai. Look at that. Three. Okay. Three out of nine. Not bad. Not bad at I all. I haven't seen any of those in the last 20 years. Neither have I. And that okay. is why I did this. So okay. I don't have a ton of time available to sit down and watch a two and a half hour long movie. And when I do, I pick the heavy hitters. Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, Karate Kid, Rocky, Star Wars. I know you're you going to love it. Yeah. Right. Because I'm like, I have to see those movies. If I don't mm. see those movies once a year, I will die. Um, so this week wow. I had so much time on my hands. I'm like, let me, let me, let me do some deep cuts here. Okay. I haven't seen the mummy since like 99. All right. Did it hold up? Yeah. Okay. Like it had some cheesy CG, but it was the best they could do. Oh well, yeah. But it, other than that, like it was awesome. It was a romp. It, it was, was just. It was really popular when it came yeah, out, right? It was like, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. It was like national treasure. I kind of think of the same thing. Yeah. Well, thing, I, I'm you know? a big fan of the uncharted video game series. So there's mm. four of those. They're all okay. great. And. I haven't seen Mummy since playing these games. And I always thought these games were just 100% Indiana Jones inspired. Yeah. I think they took some cues from The Mummy. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Like The Mummy, I think, was more influential than I ever gave it credit for. Hmm. So that was a fun, fun time. Okay. Same thing with Mask of Zorro. Like, I think hmm. those were like 98 and 99 that they both came okay. out. And I wouldn't have watched either of these if I didn't have a whole week, you know? Hmm. And Mask of Zorro was just exceptional from beginning to end the only thing terrible mm. was anthony hopkins pretending he was mexican like that's just he didn't even a little, try a little cringy these days like yeah. he was just straight up british accent right. like that's not even he did there was no effort there well, i mean yeah. he has an amazing natural voice i guess they were just like you know what just don't just 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 don't people just want to hear your voice yeah so <laughs> but that was so much fun there was no cg at all all mm. the effects were practical Big, real explosions, amazing horse stunts, mm. sword fights, swinging, whipping, like just like it felt like a modern, you know, Errol Flynn movie or something mm. like that. Like it was, yeah, I had a ton of fun with that one. That one really surprised me um, because it had been so long. Yeah. Cowboys and Aliens also is always fun. It's cheesy as heck it's to Daniel say. Daniel Craig, right? It's Daniel Craig, Harrison Ford. I've heard Ford. really good things about it, but it's I've never seen it. Harrison Ford, Daniel Craig, um, uh, 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 that kid from um, uh, There Will Be Blood, Paul Dano, and of course, mm. Walton Goggins, my boy. Uh, and But the thing is, it's a ridiculous concept mm. and overall a silly screenplay, but John Favreau was an amazing director and mm. all of these actors are tremendously talented actors. For sure. And every, oh, Olivia Wilde was in there as well. Um, mm. Every time something silly happened, oh, uh, Clancy Brown, love Clancy Brown. He was the... Um, uh, head guard in Shawshank Redemption. Okay. Like he's fantastic always. I've never seen Shawshank Redemption. Oh man. I've seen parts of it. I you, know I know you, the whole you'd, movie. Yeah, but you'd love it. It's I would fantastic. love it. I know. Yeah. I just need to watch it. But every time something ridiculous happens, you're like, oh, come on. What's that? And you look at Harrison Ford. 
dead freaking serious. Daniel Craig, dead freaking serious. And everybody else is just exceptional, like world class A list actors. And you're like, oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah continue. This is serious, yeah. It's it's such <laughs> a crazy concept, yeah. but yet it's it's every bit as good as it could possibly be, that's given fun. the core concept. <laughs> so I'm I love that's that cool. movie. That's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Copland also, I will say that that is Sylvester Stallone's third best performance. Oh. You have Rambo First Blood Part 1, or yeah, Rambo First Blood, Rocky 1, Copland. Wow, really? Exceptional. Yeah, he put on weight for that and everything. Like, wow. You know, he's just phenomenal. And that that's like greatest hits, you know, uh, actors too. Pretty much any actor that was ever in any mob movie is mm. in Copland. Okay. So many Sopranos cameos as well. So cool. I had a great time with my movie watching. So much fun. Um, and I just had, I just, I... Took the uh, my four person you know love sack, pulled that up right in front of my TV. You know, I put the, I put a sheet on there so I could have the dogs on there with me because oh that's cool. Um, got both the dogs, got a cup of coffee, a little bowl of Cheez Its, and I'm just like, oh. Cheez Its with coffee. That's an interesting. Combo. I like it. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, man. You do you, man. So it was it was a fantastic week. It that was a very dreary. Yeah. yeah. Um, Any video gaming or is it? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I hopped oh, okay. into Metal Gear Solid Five every okay. every now and okay. then. I've re I've played it before, so I'm yeah. not like it doesn't like suck me in. I'm like, all right, all let right. me jump on that, play okay. a little bit. I'm kind of like in limbo because I really want a PS5, mm. so I'm kind of waiting on any new game purchases until I can get yeah, that. Because like done. any new game you get, it's just going to set you back. One hundred percent, exactly. Yeah, I get it. Exactly. I get it. So we did that, um, and then Friday, I allowed myself to go out for my for breakfast at my favorite diner. Nice. You know, sat up at the at the bar, got myself some corned beef hash and pancakes and eggs. <laughs> and, awesome. Oh yeah. So it was as it was it was absolutely like a Drew week off for mm. sure. And um, and I finished the costume, so yeah. Um, nice. Over the weekend, we went to a Halloween themed roller skating event, and okay. uh, I wore this, and nice. you know, got on some roller blades for the first time. And whoa, yeah, talk about nostalgia. So I had gone, I had, I had gone roller skating within the past five years, but okay. the place we went only rented skates. Right. This okay. other place, uh, which is by the airport, actually rented blades, and I was like, oh, okay. When's the last time you went rollerblading? Before that, jeez, I have no idea. <laughs> Were you an adult, or was it like I think so, an adolescent? Yeah, I think so. Rachel and I did a little bit in college. Like I bought a I bought a pair of rollerblades when we got when we were in college, and then I really didn't do it much after that. I still don't know how to stop. I have no idea how to you stop. Got, do you have the stopper on the back? You can. You either like lean back on the stopper because it's usually on your like your right foot that it has a, a brake on it, or you just drag. One of I, your feet. I don't like, know how to drag do that. the wheels. I, I can I can like spin and that slows me down. Okay. So if I'm if I'm going slow enough, the spin will stop me. Okay. But otherwise You're just like redirecting your yeah, centrifugal force yeah. or whatever. <laughs> but otherwise I'll like spin and then slam into the wall, like with my okay. back. Like gotcha. so that, that's a pretty proven Yeah, you can like sort of <laughs> glide on one foot and like drag like the side of the wheels. I should probably try on the that. ground yeah. to do that, you know. But Our Archer was having such a difficult time because he has these pair of skates that he can attach to the back of his shoes, right? Okay. Kind of like Heelys. Um, okay, okay. But there's no front skate. So he does the thing hmm. like what kids do with Heelys where you put one foot flat and you arc up your right foot. Right. And you kind of just like coast, but with one foot pointed up. Yeah, yeah. And he was doing that with the roller skates. Right. And I'm like, no, Archer, you keep your feet together. Right. And you push off on one, push off on the other. Yeah. And he would not do it. Wow. He just kept on like, scoot, 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 coast. Scoot, 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 coast. That's how he wants to do it, man. And Shana was getting mad at me. She's like, stop telling him the way to do it. I'm like, but he's... He, but he's, he's doing it wrong. <laughs> he's Well, he was getting frustrated because he couldn't oh. do it. I'm like, well, so... I'm doing like the, the the dad thing, being like, well, let me, you're not doing it right. And she's like saying, let him learn on his own. And I'm trying to listen, but also he's getting upset yeah. because he can't do it, but yet he's not trying the right way. So yeah, I have to bite it. my tongue a lot. Shannon would tell you I failed at biting it, but anyway. Wow. Um, that was that fun. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and then the day after that, we went to see Nick Offerman, this time at the Altria Theater. So. Oh. Yeah, it was busy. Shannon kept me busy. She's like, oh, well, you had a week off. Now let's do stuff. Okay. <laughs> So this is all not being off. This no, this was like, this past weekend. So okay. Just a couple days ago. Gotcha. Yeah. So all we saw right. Nick Offerman. He did stand up. He played some songs. He brought his acoustic That's guitar. Cool. He was clean shaven. Weird. So yeah, no mustache, no beard. Just yeah. totally, totally clean. Uh, okay. Um, but that was fun. Um, he's a big woodworker too. Yeah. I really he love he, his he job. He talked a bit about that. He had a whole song about how he's not Ron Swanson. 
and stop right. talk stop mentioning how why doesn't he have his mustache or why is he eating salad or yeah the whole thing was about like how he'd be dead if he was ron swanson true the woodworking though that was real yeah 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 i believe that was his real shop that they used i think it might have been yeah yeah not his current shop his current shop is amazing oh he's got a whole staff i think oh he's got yeah. like wood slabs everywhere it's yeah. awesome he yeah. built some kick butt canoes oh yeah i've read his first book paddle yeah. your own canoe yeah i i have no desire to canoe i have no means to really canoe i guess we have water around here yeah but seeing his canoes makes me want to build a canoe they're stunning but it also probably takes longer than i would think yeah and i, would I didn't know that they coated those <laughs> with this like transparent fiberglass that makes sense yeah because wood there's is like not a, great with water yeah, no there's like a it, it, but it turns invisible it's yeah. crazy. I had no idea. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. I messed around with that when I was doing like some car audio stuff. It's the same oh. kind of thing. So it's like a it's like a fiberglass mesh yeah. that you use, like a weave, and then you put the resin over top of it. Exactly. And it kind of all just turns translucent. I had no idea. Yeah. I saw it being done. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. I mean, that makes total sense. Yeah. But yeah. um, so then we tried a trunk or treat event. Archer got on his costume. We were okay. all excited because his school usually does them, but they didn't do one this year. Oh. So they said, all right, go to this other high school. And they're doing one. He's like so, mooching off some other school's trunk or tree. I guess so. We're like, all right, cool. Let's go. So we got, he got all his stuff. I clipped him in and had it all set up and it was hot. Mm -hmm. We get to the school. There's nobody there. There's like really? one car. We're like, I guess we're early, but we're 30 minutes after when it began. So we walk up and there's this high school student saying, I, oh, sorry. Uh, we're all out of candy. So everybody went home and we're like, wait, what? Oh yeah. We, we changed it to two hours earlier, but <laughs> I guess because we didn't get the email from that high school. We got right. it from our school. That email didn't reach us. So super disappointing. Wow. The, the, um, we brought uh, Archer's, we met Archer's friend there too. But the kids were good. They didn't freak out or anything. Um, wow. Yeah, it was Still super lame. Disappointing. Yeah, very, very much a big bummer there. Hmm. But we found a, a nearby church that just happened to have one. They had like four cars. So sure. It's a consolation prize, but yeah, yeah we got them some candy. <laughs> then we had a Halloween party at a friend's house. I won't get into this. It's already taking too much time. I'm tired just hearing there was about a whole, your activities here. Yeah, Halloween party at a friend's <laughs> house. We dressed up for that. And then we carved a pumpkin. Archer carved a pumpkin. We went to Williamsburg to see all the leaves. <sighs> and then I came to work and filmed three videos. Like in like the first two hours I was there. Yeah. <laughs> I was like <laughs> jumping right into the you saddle. You really hit the ground running there. Yeah. Wow. But no, it was, the, the week itself was n super chill, nothing. Yeah. But the weekends bookending it were super busy. It sounds like they should be reversed. Like everything you said you did on the weekend, that sounds like a week's worth of activities. Nope. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot. It was wild. It's a lot. Okay. Is that it? You got any more? I mean, I could go into detail, <laughs> but who, who wants to hear that? I don't. Well, we got, I, I got my <laughs> stuff too. Um, that's very cool. Um, so I... The reason I was taken off two weeks ago is because I went to a uh, com uh, a conference for e-commerce business owners. Um, so it's this group that I belong to, and uh, it was in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, it, it moves around every year, uh, but I went down to that. So I got to spend a few days with other crazy e-commerce people. I'm like- Bunch of loonies. Yeah, I'm like the weird, like the pen guy there. There's other people that have equally obscure, crazy businesses. One guy I know smells, sells uh, gas masks, like, you know, for like biohazard type stuff. Entire interesting, is interesting, gas masks. You all, interesting you accidentally said smells instead of sells, sells yeah. regarding a it's, gas mask. It's smells, actually, smells gas masks. Yeah, it's actually long. kind of appropriate. Um, other people, there's lots of like people doing like clothing and cosmetics, stuff like that. But it's pretty in lots of pet products as well. But like because it's e-commerce, everybody there is like highly niche, like specialized. So it's like organic you know, freshly delivered pet treats and stuff like that, like yeah. hyper specific products. And so normally when I operate in the real world, I tell people like, I saw like fountain pens on the internet and they're like, what? Like it's inconceivable that that's really even a thing. And I'm like, yeah, we have like a staff of 30 and they're like, what? But I go to this thing and I talk to people and they're like, oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> like that doesn't sound weird to them. Unfazed. Because this other guy sells like, oh, yeah, I sell organic duck meat for dogs. Yeah. Not weird at all. <laughs> Not weird at all. So these are my people. Um, so that was really cool just to get to and, and just get a pulse on like 
what's going on in the landscape, the economic landscape and all that. Because you think the Internet's here to stay? You know, if it is a fad, you know, then so be it. All we'll, right. we'll figure it out. You know, people, some people are going back to flip phones. Maybe we'll go back to landlines and, you know, maybe dial, dial up. up. Maybe ah. we'll keep dial up. That's a good right. compromise, you know. That way, uh, you know, you have to ask your mom if she can, you know, get off the phone so you can check your instant messenger and all these things. Um, no. Uh, so that was really cool. And then since I was in Jacksonville, that is where Pilot USA is located. That's right. And I have not been down there to see them since 2015. Oh, wow. So it's been eight years. Uh, and so while I was there, I just like tacked on an extra day and I went and got to hang out with them and see their facility. I got to see the um, expanded cage that they ah. have for the fine writing products. So they have a this warehouse. It's probably 120,000 square feet. It's like five stories high, forklifts, you know, uh, uh, what is it like the conveyor, like roller conveyor is kind of going everywhere. It's very sophisticated, but the bulk of that is things like G2s and, you know, all their like ballpoint gel, rollerball stuff. But then all of the like fountain pen, the fine writing stuff is like literally caged in with like security badges and all this kind of stuff. Um, because it's all the like really expensive stuff. So everybody calls that the cage. And so I got to go in there and see that and see the, the folks who work in there and, and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was pretty cool. So I think I spent a whole lot of time there. And I talked about some stuff that's like sort of in the works, but none of it's public to share yet. But we're working on some cool stuff with them. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but that was really cool. And then the other thing that just so happened to be there, um, the Blue Angels, like the Navy elite oh, yeah. flying like demonstration group, um, they were doing like a show in Jacksonville that weekend. This was like on a Thursday. So they weren't doing the show yet, but they were flying around practicing their drills and stuff. Oh, cool. So here I am like outside having lunch with them, catching up on stuff, but like, planes would fly by and like you couldn't even you couldn't even talk as they're flying by because they're flying like fairly low so we just be kind of talking and then we just like there's there's trees and stuff around us so we would just like hear a jet and we're like what where is it where is it and then we might see like some jets like doing some crazy maneuvers and stuff and we're like what what is going on so oh, wow. that was just really fun and interesting um to to get to see so i didn't know they were navy yeah blue angels are navy yep it makes sense there's a uh, my wife was born on the Jacksonville Naval Base. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. There you go. Well, I was right back in her home turf there. Um, so it's kind of neat. Um, I also went to Kids Empire. I did not time it as well. I went on a Saturday when the weather was beautiful and there were like a thousand people in there. Um, and my kids are not on the smaller end or the younger end of the kids that were big kids in there. So for them, it was a little more of like a, I don't know, it was, it was like, seeing them with a lot of other kids i don't know they hang out with their friends a lot i see them in school but we're not doing as many of those types of activities these days with them so like seeing them with a bunch of other like little kids running around i was like oh yeah my kids are like not they're like they could babysit most of the other kids that are in that place so for them it was less of like the reckless abandon running around like crazy and it was a more of like they had to be conscious not to like knock other kids over and other kids at least they were shenanigans. My kids are great. They're very conscientious. That's awesome. Um, but we still got to run around. And it's like big enough, like you said, like adults can be in there. So like Rachel and I ran around with them for a little bit. Rachel a little less than me. I was like, yeah, let's do it. But it's like made for adult sizes, but there were some like places that you had to sort of squeeze through. And I would like try to squeeze through. And I was like, okay, I'm a big guy. Like I'm used to not fitting in places, but like my bones wouldn't fit through yeah. some of those places. I'm like, this is not an issue of me being like bulky. This is like not made for like I my skeleton. <laughs> I feel like I almost got stuck once. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. So my kids were like, oh, chase me. And I was like, ha ha ha. And then I'll be like, oh, I can't go in that part of it. Okay. <laughs> and I'll be like, try and run around. I was like, this is just, yeah, <laughs> this is hard. But I did some fun slides and I didn't do the thing that you're talking about, the drop thing. But my my kids did. Ellie especially really enjoyed that. Yeah. You but, got, you, you do need to, the trick, you do need to, you can't go completely floppy. You need to. You gotta like, like maneuver your limbs through because your limbs will get caught on the well, things, right? Yeah. To make it look funny though, you need to have some rigidity to your limbs just so you flop okay. around properly. Right. Because right. if you go totally limp, you'll just kind of like blah slowly. Yeah. You need to create bounce a little yeah. bit. I, I acted quite exaggeratedly just for yeah. comedic effect, but it was a lot of fun that way. That is fun. See, I, I, I couldn't have even gone on if I wanted to because first off, I will like 
kill any child that I would fall on top of. Yeah, there was nothing I beneath to, us. There were there were like probably a dozen kids on that thing at any given time. What? And then other kids were just like diving into it and falling through and hitting other kids. It oh was like God. Lord of the Flies oh in there. Oh my God. And I was like, is there like any people here? There's no signs, there's no nothing. And like, oh no, it was totally empty for us. Yeah. I was the only one doing it. There was like maybe two other kids in the whole thing other than the yeah. ones we brought. So I was just. I think the time you go matters a lot. Yeah, it must. But anyway, it was still a lot of fun. The kids cool. had a great time. Um, and then let's see here, what else did we do? So I've been working with Joseph on his Halloween costume. Mm -hmm. So originally he wanted to go as Omega, which is a robot character from Sonic the Hedgehog. So he showed me this picture of Omega and I was like, okay, we can probably do like a very simplified version of this costume. It's like somewhat uh, like uh, uh, human body shaped, but the, like the proportions are not- You told me he was a robot. To a human body. He's a robot. Robot. But like a humanoid sort of robot, but like not human proportions. And Joseph's really like tall and lanky and skinny. And this robot is like short and squatty and mm. broad shouldered and all that. So I was like trying to work with him, not, not with like foam and all that. I didn't have- time or patience or energy for that. So it was just like cardboard and duct tape. So we were trying to do it together. We got like part of the costume built, but then I, we had like a week out and I've been like prompting him a lot. And, but I was, I did not just gonna like build him this costume. He's 13. I'm like, come on, dude. But I was uh, pruning some trees and I accidentally cut my hand with the pruning saw. It was just, it was a stupid thing. You know, it's like sometimes you do something and you're like, I know I, this is probably not the proper technique, but I'm sure it'll be fine. And like 99 times out of 100, it is fine. I had that thought with this one. So I was cutting, it was a really thin holly tree. It was along our driveway and the holly leaves are like really scratchy. So I was like, well, let me cut these holly branches. It was way down the driveway. So I didn't feel like going to getting my like loppers. So I just had the handsaw and I was like, okay, I'll just saw that off. But it was really thin. It was like not a half inch or something, but the, the tree itself was really thin twiggly. It was like really thin and kind of flopped around. So I needed to like hold the tree to cut it, but it was really awkward how it was. So I swapped hands. I held the tree with my right hand and I was cutting with my left hand. And even though it was like a foot above and I was like, I'll probably be okay. Like even as I cut through, it'll yeah, drop you'll down. you'll have enough time to stop. But I just misjudged it. And so as I cut through, my hand came down and just like gashed right into my hand. And I was like, well, that's the rest of my day. So I dropped everything, went in the house. There's whatever medical things happening, but didn't need stitches or anything. It wasn't yeah. that bad. But I mean, considering it definitely considering like all of the much more bit. dangerous tools you use, if you are going to hurt yourself on a blade, you know, what? having a manual blade do the damage yeah. is probably the best thing. Well, you know what? It's like if I was if I was chainsawing, I would have had all the gear. I would have mm -hmm. done everything. I had gloves on, but they were they were gloves that were like protected like more of my palms. They and it was really hot, so I didn't wear like my full like leather gloves like I would if I was like more seriously. It was just like I was just making a couple of quick cuts, just like more people fall off of like step ladders, yeah, than they do off of like 40 foot ladders. So it was just one of those things like I wasn't quite as careful as it's it a different been. mindset, yeah. And then as soon as I cut myself, I was like, dag on it, I know better than this. So I was like, okay, so I was like. And that's literally when it was like getting crunch time for Joseph's costume. So I'm like trying to help him. And I'm like, buddy, I'm sorry. I can't like, I can't use my hand to like cut anything. And so that was part of the, maybe yeah. part of the reason, but it was, it all worked out for the best. So what did he switch to? He switched to, well, he had the idea to do uh, Rick Astley and he was going to Rick roll everybody. Both of your kids like, are kind of obsessed with Rick rolling, right? Oh, it's a whole thing. Like Rick <laughs> rolling is alive and well in the middle school world. Um, yeah. Like they will, I think they have these things, uh, you know, they have like, like like these like bucks or whatever that they like earn for doing good stuff and they can trade it in at the store for like chips or erasers and stuff like that. Joseph said that last year, like I think it was like the entire eighth grade or something saved up like a thousand of these things. And they played Rick Astley is never going to give you up on like the morning announcements or something. So they like Rick, Rick rolled the entire school. And Ellie requested it at the school dance that she went oh to. And the DJ played that as the last song. And they all freaking love it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. Um, so yeah, I didn't have a good costume idea. And when Joseph wanted to pivot to that, I was like, that sounds doable. Like, easy. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, that'd be kind of cool if we went as like we so he he we're both going as Rick Astley specifically, the outfit that he is wearing when the song first plays 
hence the Rick roll thing. So yeah, that's what he's doing. So I'm like, yeah, that's good. That's so he's good. got a blazer and a striped shirt as well. Yeah. He already had the striped shirt. He's going to borrow one of my suit jackets, which looks enormous on him, but, uh, you know, it works. I'm not going to buy him a suit jacket. That's just awesome. That, but it'll, it'll, he'll pull it off. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then no, the sleeves are actually not too far off. He's just like a lot skinnier oh, than me. Wow. Like, they're, can, they're a bit long. Yeah. But, you can clip it in the back. Well, you know me with suits like, these yeah. are the sleeves for me. That's right. No, no. This is my life. Yeah. No, no, no sleeve is I long enough. Freakish long arms. Um, yeah. And then, you know, it's that time of year. I had the return of the Asian lady beetles oh, attacking my house. Oh, yep. yes. We avoided it for most of the year, but oh, it's been, man. it was unseasonably warm last week. Even just yesterday, I think it was like 82 degrees. Yeah, any of you veteran Pencast listeners will remember the days where they, will, the they would just be crawling behind Brian's you know, camera, he'd be yeah. talking on the pencast and you'd see one just crawl along the background. Yeah, hundreds of them. Like they just, whatever it is, just at our front door. Yeah. I think it's something with like the afternoon sun when it Time to get out the bug like vacuum. That. We got the vacuum out. It's still just chilling <laughs> out there, re ready to go. But it dropped like 30 degrees yes, since yesterday and it's going to stay there. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in the 50s now. So I think, I think we'll, that's the end of the Lady Beetles. So we'll, we'll see. Good. Um, anyway, we knew we know that that's just a thing now. Um, and then you were off, but we had a mental health half day. So you were mental health weeking. Um, right. That's because I actually <coughs> didn't. I know the goal was for me to take a lot of time off. Yeah. But I, we get a free day off for our birthday. So I used that for Monday. Oh, gosh. But then we only yeah. had a half day I needed to use on Friday. Oh, so you got that so, time anyway. So I only took like three full three, days. Three full days. <laughs> Dang on it, Drew. I'm going to kick you out of here more. <laughs> Except you do a lot of things that make my life easier. So I don't really want you going that much. Oh, it's a balance. I'll take that. Um, I'll, we'll, yeah. I think we'll be taking Thanksgiving off. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, for me, the mental health half day is good. Obviously it's good for the whole team, but it actually like forces me to like, okay, I'm, I'm going to specifically try to do something that's like just for mental health, nice. or, like, just for me. So I ended up staying a little bit, little bit late because I was playing around with some like microphone kind of stuff. And I was like, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I ran in some roadblocks and I was like, all right, screw this. I'll do this later. Um, and I went and ran a couple of errands. One of them was, I just, I couldn't get it out of my head. So I used to, to play a lot of musical instruments when I was younger. All right. Hang um, on, hang on. You did bass clarinet. That was one of them. The, it wasn't a tuba. It was a it's close. Basically a tuba. Sousaphone? Sousaphone, yeah. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a marching tuba, yeah. All right. Was there a third one? I played I did ten different instruments. Ten? Yeah. Oh dang it, here I am if thinking. You include I, voice. Here I am thinking I, I can here I am thinking I could name them all. Yeah. Ten? Yeah. Oh so, my god. Oh, bass guitar. Bass guitar. Bass guitar. Yeah. I don't know, man. I'm not gonna get to ten. So, well, I did some of them were like similar to each other, but uh clarinet, bass clarinet, and contrabass clarinet. Oh, okay. So contrabass clarinet was like the biggest thing I played in high school. Oh, okay. I like was like all I remember clarinet. Like that. I, yeah. I feel like I get they're, three They're all three, three different versions that. of yeah. clarinets, but they were all different instruments that I played. I'm still going to claim bands. three points. Okay. Yeah, you, you deserve it. Um, I sing, obviously. Um, and then, I don't know if that's obvious, but Rachel and I met singing. So that's... It's not know, obvious, but it's well known. It's not obvious right now because I'm not well actively <laughs> singing. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, I sing. I did, I did piano for a little bit. I didn't, didn't know super that. Good. Yeah. Rachel's mother's a piano teacher. I didn't know that. So I took some lessons and I. From her? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <gasps> in college. I did not know that. Yeah. Huh. yeah. I got up to like level three. Look at me still then, figuring out yeah. things about Brian Goulet. Yeah. Huh. Um, and then I did guitar and then bass guitar. And. Uh, I did sousaphone, which I marched in the the regimental marching band of Virginia. Does that Zach. have anything to do with Philip Sousa? Um, is it? It would. You would think so. Like, I just. It just. Not? It just popped into my head. That would. Also, I just found I don't out. Know that the history of it, but that would make sense. Archer asked me. He saw a mud daubered nest this weekend. Oh. And I said, he's like, those look like the Peter Pan flute, and it got me thinking, like. I wonder what came first, the pan flute or Peter Pan? Hmm. It turns out that Pan, the Greek god, the 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 um satyr. Okay. The pan flute is named after him, and Peter Pan is inspired from Pan, hey. the Greek okay. mythological character. Okay. Didn't know that. All right, go on. There you go. Neat. Okay. Um. So yeah, and then I played tenor sax and baritone sax oh, as well. I forget about that one. Yeah, I didn't Dang. play those for long because what happened is. I played, you know, contrabass clarinet was like my main instrument in mm -hmm. high school. And then when I went to Virginia Tech and I was, I joined the the military marching band there called the Heidi Tidies. But 
you can't march a contrabass clarinet. So they were like, well, you need to have an instrument that we can actually march with. And I was like, well, I don't know what that's going to be. And well, I was like, okay, well, here's a tenor sax. It was like a tenor sax is in the key of B flat. It's, you know, similar. Some of the fingers are similar. So it was like, here, learn tenor sax and march with it. And so I did my freshman year. And then I, the second half of my freshman year, um, so when you joined there, we were not allowed to listen to music. We couldn't play video games. We had no TV. Like it was very strict in the program. Um, but one of the loopholes <laughs> was if you joined the uh, jazz band, then you could listen to the jazz music that you were playing to learn it better. And so I was like, I want to listen to music because I was like, needed some music real bad. And I'd never been in a jazz band, just sounded fun. Um, but they already had like a bunch of good tenor saxes and they're like, well, we don't have baritone sax. And I was like, all right, I'll try that. It's in the key of E flat. It's bass clef instead of treble clef. It was entirely different than what I'd played before, but it was still a saxophone. So I was like, what the heck? I had so much fun playing that instrument. So was it, so so you're saying like, did you revisit one of these? Well, the reason I tell all this story is because I'm like, you know, you and I both, we're approaching 40. We are. And I'm like, yeah, I remember doing these things and it doesn't really feel that long ago, but I'm like, holy crap, that was that, was that long ago. Yeah. I was 18 my freshman year of college when Which I was is playing more than 20 years ago, 21 years ago is the last time I played, you know, a berry sax or a tenor sax. And it's like, holy crap. Like that was one year of my life that I played those two instruments and I played them a lot. Like I, it was a big part of my life, but that was 21 years ago. That was so long ago. And the problem is most of the instruments I played. The distance between now and then was greater than oh. your existence up until that point. Right, exactly. It's like, dang, that really has been a while. And so I was kind of like, I kind of missed that a little bit. And it's like, well, I don't have time for it. And it's like, well, screw it, whatever. So I was like, you know what? Let me just, let me just see. Let me just see if I could like rent one and try it. And just see if I still have the goods, mm. still have the chops. So I called around to some music stores. I couldn't find a Barry sax to rent. Maybe there are some, I just need to call around more, but they're they're really big and you know they're hard to track down um, and they're really expensive. So it's like, I can't just like buy one on spec, you know, but it was like, okay, tenor sax. Okay, it's a little easier to find. So I found a rental store and I went down there and they let me like sample it and kind of play it. And I'll be honest, like I didn't even tell Rachel I was doing it because she was working from home and I was here at the office and I just like went there after <laughs> the office on Friday. And so she was like talking to me about like our plans for the weekend or whatever. And I was like, I rented a saxophone. I gotta, I gotta be honest with you, dear. I'm like, well, I didn't rent it. I didn't rent it without asking her about it. Oh, okay. Obviously it's going to have an auditory impact <laughs> on her because it's not a quiet instrument. You need a saxophone shed. But I was like, I know we <laughs> joked about that. We <laughs> joked about that. Like go out to the workshop and play the sax. Um, but no, I was like, as as she was like texting me and stuff like that, I was like, I have to confess, I'm at a music store <laughs> playing a tenor sax. Oh my I was God. Like, I was like, is this crazy? And she was like super supportive. She's amazing. She was like, you really love this music and you haven't done it in forever. And so I was like, okay. So they had some that were like really cheap student grade ones that I could just buy, but then they had like some nicer ones to rent. And she was like, why don't you rent one first? Let's see how it goes. That's and I was exactly like- Exactly what Shannon would have said like, to me. I was like, that's- very reasonable and that's what i was leaning on doing anyway um so i did i rented it and i've been playing it since this was like friday last week so it's very fresh but um i like literally had to look up the fingering charts i couldn't remember what the notes oh, were and stuff not. like that but i gotta tell you man it's coming back quick oh, nice. it really is and i'm like ah oh, this is really really fun that is really i cool. really enjoy this so i'm, I'm getting back into the oh that's sacks, so man. exciting that's fun what do the kids think have <sighs> they ever seen you play an instrument uh not really that's Not gotta really. be cool. Cause I have I mean, they've seen us sing. Like Rachel and I have sung a ton. That, is that, that doesn't like impress them or surprise them? I don't know what they think about it. It's, I don't know. Oh. They're, they're like, don't really know what to think at this point. <laughs> I mean, we have like a piano and Rachel plays and stuff like yeah. that. Um, and I plink around a little bit. And I've busted out my clarinet a couple of times. Oh, okay. You know, because I still, I own one of those. But oh, it's really small and it's just not as, I'm not, I was never, I was not as good on the clarinet. Yeah, I really, I really didn't play the clarinet regularly since like seventh grade. Yeah. So it's like, no. Nah. Um, but the sax is a little easier to jump back into. So having a good time playing the sax. Um, but yeah, anyway, so watching a lot of YouTube videos about it now and my 
my feed, my algorithm is so confused. Oh, I bet. They're just like, what the heck is up with this guy? I bet. I'm like watching economy videos and tractors and tenor saxes. And they're just <laughs> like, what <laughs> What random group of like, you know, attention deficit, you know, children are watching this YouTube channel? Yep. Uh, it's all over the place. Um, That's yeah. amazing. So I rented that. That was pretty fun. And then it was funny because like here I was feeling a little bit impulsive and what Rachel was texting me about, this was mid Friday afternoon here. She was like, Hey, my parents are free this weekend. What if we just like drove up and saw them because her parents and her sister were free. They're like a two hour drive away. Um, and I was like, uh, when did you want to go? <laughs> Cause like, I'm like running all these errands and stuff. And uh, we ended up going up there to see them this weekend. We had left on Saturday and came back Sunday. It was like super quick trip, but still good. Did you do any so, yeah. home improvement chores while you were there? There was like no time. <gasps> we just, no, I didn't First do anything. Time. I did nothing productive. I did some video prep. That's what I was working on oh, nice. while I was up there. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of cool. And then uh, the other thing I did that afternoon is I went to the like local landscaping place and started scoping out patio like paver stones and stuff like that to look at doing that's gonna be expensive man pavers are expensive and i like drew out like where i would want it to be just kind of visually and i measured it out and i'm like oh, oh there's a lot of stone so i don't know rachel and i are figuring out what we don't want to do because it's like i really want to do it because i think it'd be great what are you and paving just just um doing like a patio on our in our back uh back oh. we, we don't have a deck anymore right so we had this like little landing so the landing just like goes out into the grass. And so yeah. it's like, it'd be nice to have, you know, somewhere to like, I don't have a place to grill. I like grill in my driveway, yeah. you know? And it's like, uh, it's it's just kind of hodgepodge. Yeah. Um, I just need to do a little bit of, do one of those paper things where my mm -hmm. uh, trash can is and then oh, a yeah, little yeah. walkway to my back porch. It's not oh. a lot, but I know you got to do several layers. You got to do like the, the mesh and then the sand yep. and then the, yep. you know. Yeah, oh. you do some gravel and then sand. And, and then you have to have a tamper. And, I'm yep. like, I'm not going to have one. of. The, I'm not going to buy one of those because I'll never use it again. Yeah. I've got all that stuff. Ugh. If you want to do that project, let me know. I don't want I to. hook you up. <laughs> I don't want to it at all. It took you a year to change out your lights. I know, and uh, I still haven't <laughs> caulked them yet either. <laughs> well, you got to give it another six months. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure they work. Good. That's right. Um, yeah. So I don't know. We'll see about the paver thing. I wanted to do it because, you know, like, before the weather gets too cold, it's like if I'm going to dig a bunch in the dirt, do it while it's still kind of warm. And now it's like starting to get colder. And I'm like, ugh. But I'm talking to Rachel and I'm like, okay, it's going to cost this much for the stones. I mean, we're talking like thousands oh, for the raw material. This is me doing do it, it myself. yourself. Yeah, just the oh, raw material is really God. expensive. Um, and we're not even getting like primo stuff. It's just stuff is expensive. And so she was like, uh, I don't really know. And I'm like, ugh. Now it's like, okay, it's just like, there's nothing back there now. So it's kind of like, yeah. it'd be nice to do something. I don't know. So we're, we're figuring that out. Yeah. Um, and then last but not least, um, Rachel had been thinking about like doing something for our 40th uh, birthday next year. And we're not big like birthday anniversary people. We don't do big You're not gift things people. like that. We're not really gift people. I can't remember like either of you in the like 15 years I've worked here, um, I can't remember any either of you like splurging on a birthday gift or a Christmas gift. We have done it. We have done it periodically. Yeah, we don't make like a big hollow balloon. No, about it, but like for like Mother's Day one year, I got Rachel this like you know personalized like Jake Weidman jewelry. I do thing remember for that. Her. That was really yeah. nice. She got me a really nice watch for my thirtieth birthday. I got her this really nice like jewelry case thing. So like we've we've done some things yeah. for each other, but it's pretty inconsistent. Yeah, and neither of us are like building up expectations at any time. We're yeah. more like Christmas or whatever rolls around and we're like, do we have to get gifts for each other this year? <laughs> right. like a gift is like not having to get gifts for each other. Yeah. I don't, I don't like, think that's super uncommon yeah. after a certain age. I really don't. Especially me with like my weird hobbies. I'm just like, hey honey, I'm gonna buy these random like specialized drill bits for myself for Father's Day. Is that cool? She's like, yeah, I don't wanna have to learn what that is and yeah. then buy it for you. I'm like, great. Works out better for both of us. This Shannon is my Father's me, Day gift. Shannon asked me what I wanted for Christmas this year. I said, I want three 27 by 41, you know, front entry poster frames. And uh -huh. she's like, she's like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> she doesn't want to like learn what that is no. to go shopping for. Yeah. I was like, even though like I'm, that, that seems dumb and boring. I'm not getting that for you. I'm like, but well, it's what, what I want. want. Yeah, no, I know, she's right? like, no, that's lame. I'm not doing that. Right. You do that yourself. Exactly. Do you want a movie? <laughs> I'm in the same boat. Yeah. So, but we, I think we decided on, we, well, not, I think we did decide on what to do. We're going to do a joint gift for each other for our 40th uh, birthday. So I don't even think I've told you about this yet. No. So this has all happened within the last 24 hours. So, um, 
Rachel got an email. So, you know, she's a big fan of Alter Bridge and Mark Tremonti is the guitarist there. Oh. Um, we saw Alter Bridge. They, were, they weren't headlining, but we saw them live like a couple of years ago. They were the opening band for Disturbed. So we went to just go see Alter Bridge and then we left. <laughs> so it was cool. They were amazing live, but it was like 45 minute set. And it was just like, ah. Oh. That's a so, lot. Yeah, even for so, a band you really like. So that's a lot. they're not they're not touring right now, but uh, Creed, which Mark Tremonti is, you know, one of the founding members of that, with like Scott Stapp, you know, higher and with arms wide open, oh, yeah. and like super nostalgic late '90s, early 2000s. Uh, they are going to be going on tour uh, next year for the first time in 12 years, and she like showed me that she's like the tickets go on presale tomorrow, and I was like Rachel. Let's just freaking do it. Nice. Let's do it. And let's get like good seats. Like let's make this something that we will like remember until we die. So we bought the tickets. It's going to be happening July of next year. That's amazing. We got great Creed seats. Tickets are like front and center. That. Creed and Three Doors Down is oh going to be gosh. opening for what them. What a time warp. I know. In Finger 11 also. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. They're like also late 90s. Oh, wow. They're calling it like the the... 90 like like best of 99 or something like yeah. that it's like totally a throwback kind of a thing and i was like rachel this is like we are who they're doing this yes, for. yes you are you know um but then in addition to that i was like is there like a vip like any type of thing because like yes. if we're gonna are you gonna be doing this let's see what they can do so uh mark germani who's the guitarist we friggin love him um who actually just came out with a Frank Sinatra Christmas album. Oh, I did hear y'all talking about that. Yeah, earlier. he did his like yeah. he did, his daughter's got Down syndrome, so he did it as like a fundraiser. He does a really good job. Like he's like a metal guitarist singer type, but he does a really good like pure like singing voice too, Frank Sinatra style. Anyway, that's beside the point. He just dropped that last week and it sounds amazing. But um, he is doing a guitar like workshop, like small workshop. And you get to like backstage tour, see all his guitar collection and uh, his like band, like rig and stuff like that, like his road rig. And I was like, Rachel, I was like, if we're going to do it, like yes. it's like it's Mark Tremont. Like she's she's been a fan of his for 25 years. I was like, Rachel, when are we ever going to do this again? You know, and so we, we did it. We bought that, too. Nice. So we're going to do like the whole thing. And That's I was like, amazing. We're going to remember this for a very long time. That's fantastic. So that'll be really fun. Oh, that'll that's be, tremendous. So next July, that'll be that'll be our little treat. So That's awesome. Very excited. And it's like Creed, whatever. I mean, it's sort of like Nickelback. Like people make fun of Creed, but they're freaking, they're really good. They don't make fun of them as much as Nickelback. I think people are really, I think it's like, yeah. it's kind of like the Star Wars prequels where like everybody that yeah. was into them has grown up and now it's like, now oh like, wait, this is oh, this, okay, this yeah, is cool. Yeah. We we, yeah. we we like this for what it is. We're going to over, overlook some things, but it, it's it's nostalgic and yeah. people yeah. are on them again. It's going to be hard nostalgia for yeah. us. It's going to be amazing. So really excited about that. I mean, so. they wouldn't be making a comeback tour if they didn't think there was interest. Well, it's funny because they, they weren't necessarily like planning on doing a comeback tour. They booked a couple of cruises. So they did like a Creed, like they had like some Creed cruises and they sold out so fast. And they were like, oh, maybe people like actually want to see this or whatever. And it just like happened to work out with a few dates. That's cool. You know, Miles Kennedy from Alter Bridge is like, he's got some solo stuff. And so, you know, he wasn't available. So they were like, oh, okay. Because I think uh, Mark Tremonti and I, I think there's like two or three members from Alter Bridge are from Creed. So like when Creed broke up, Alter Bridge was like sort of like the revival band of Creed. Just they replaced Scott Stapp. Yeah, um, that sounds. I can't familiar. remember if like the bassist was different, or maybe, but at I least know. a couple I, of I them. I remember. I remember I was working at Circuit City when that album came out, so I remember selling it. Oh, it was huge. Yeah, yeah. Human Clay. That was a no, no. Alter epic Bridge. One. Oh, Alter Bridge yeah. when they came out. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Alter Bridge is so good, man so good anyway we're big fans <laughs> uh so yeah just really mark tremonti's amazing so yeah we'll be doing that. that's cool fun so glad like, y'all are doing rachel that. and i like i'm like oh maybe i should like pick up my guitar because yeah. like you can bring your guitar and like yeah. play with him get lessons and stuff like that and i'm like it doesn't really matter you like got we time like, well i just literally want to like chill with him and watch him play because he's yeah. unbelievable so yeah that's gonna be wild i'm glad y'all splurge a little bit you we never, never do you stuff never like this know, we never do never stuff like do this. stuff like that I'm like just going anywhere, doing anything. Yeah, is no, something special. Yes, it is. I had to really like, really convince Rachel. I'm glad to you do did. It. I could tell she like sort it, but I was like, Rachel, let's do this. And she was like, No, the money, blah blah blah. And I was like, Rachel, for real, like, we come on, are gonna remember this for ever. Yes, let's good for it. you. Treat yeah. yourself, yeah. Rachel. I never do that stuff like that either. But no, like, yeah. Anyway, 
Literally, this is like all transpired. Like we got the tickets this morning. Yeah, I remember so, y'all. Uh, you know, you mentioned it. Yeah, but. we were having a meeting, and then I was like, "All right, we gotta jump off real quick." We gotta get like, free tickets. The tickets are going live, and they were going fast. Like as we were buying them, you could see like seats were getting snatched oh up. Oh my god! So yeah, it was pretty cool. That'll so, be exciting. Anyway. Yep. All right, that's what's happening in our world. A um, couple of company updates, and then we'll wrap it up. All right. Well. A couple company updates for us here. We uh, we had Halloween and we had celebrated with a chili and mac and cheese cook off. And I am so I know. sleepy. I yeah, you've, <sighs> you've been yawning. I'm like trying not to I'm just, catch it. You know. Ugh. Yeah, the coffee and everything too. It's a uh, it's really good. Our team well, coffee doesn't make me hyper. Doesn't perk you up. No, no. Coffee calms me down. Yeah. Okay. I, the caffeine does that backwards thing with me. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, but no, man, I had like, I had a whole plate of mac and cheese. I went back for a second bowl of mac and cheese of my favorite. Mm -hmm. And then I had three bowls of chili. Oh my God. Not, not full bowls, mind yeah, you, yeah, but yeah. I needed to see, it was a contest. I needed to. You got to try all of them. Oh, and then I had that sausage dip too. With that was the, really good. Oh my God. Yeah. Our team really brought oh. a lot and they had cookies and cornbread. And yeah. It was really good. It was really avocados. Yeah. It just. <laughs> wipe me out we had way too much food we had a lot of leftovers yeah. it was glorious um Ugh. but i didn't plan this out well we had meatloaf last night oh and then we had chili and then we're going to a like, halloween thing with one of ellie's you know friends family they're oh, they're man. cooking chili so i'm gonna have chili again tonight oh i'm like oh my gosh i'm gonna crap my brains out tonight enjoy and then we have like a lot of chili left over ourselves because <laughs> Rachel made hers and I was just like, uh, we need to like freeze it or something. I can't, I can't eat chili for like a week continuously. <laughs> uh, it's really good, but dang. I laugh because I, I have absolutely done that before because oh, Shannon yeah. makes chili and I'm the one that eats it for an entire week. Absolutely. It's delicious. I yeah. enjoy it, but. Mm. Yeah, it catches up with you after a while. Ooh. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was a lot of fun. We had a costume contest as well. Um, that was a good time had by all. So Glenn won. Glenn won. He did. Again, yep. second year in he a row. Did. He really went all out, man. It was pretty fun. Um, and then we have a video that we published last week. If you missed it, uh, top demonstrator pens. So these are my favorites and uh, I get to have some fun with this one. We have no video that we published this week except for the pen cast, um, but we'll pick back up on our regular schedule next week. All right, that's it for company updates. And uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this thing up. All right. I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us some questions so we can keep the show going. Uh, check out goodlaypens.com, the sponsor of today's program, uh, for all your fountain pen, ink, and paper needs. Like and subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. No, X, sorry. It's not Twitter anymore. Pinterest, uh, TikTok, Facebook. Yeah, we're, we're in those places. We are. I'm trying to think of am I missing anything. No, I think that's it. My random fun fact... I was a little lazy this week and I just pulled one as we were talking. So I was curious how many Pokemon are there total. Oh my God. In the Pokeverse. 3,000? It's a, apparently 1,021. That's it? That's it. Oh. That's okay. it. Yeah. I thought there was more. There have been so but many games. There are a lot. So what it says, due to the large number of Pokemon, listing of each species is divided into articles by generation. 1,017 of the 1021 Pokemon are organized by their number in the National Pokedex, an in-game electronic encyclopedia that provides various information on Pokemon. The, Poke the National Pokedex is subdivided into regional Pokedex series, each revolving around species introduced at the time of their respective generations, along with older generations. For example, the Johto Pokedex, Generation 2, covers the 100 species introduced in gold and silver in addition to the original 151 species. And I could go on and on, but there's a whole Wikipedia page about, not Pokemon, about list of Pokemon. That is a Wikipedia page. So if you want to learn all about the catalog management of Pokemon, there's a Wikipedia page for you. I know all the ones I know are from Gen 1, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Sam here is surprisingly adept at naming the original 151. I've wanted to kind Pokemon. of like pit him versus Micah to see if they could d name all. We did, we did a contest. I think it was a while ago, right? Where Sam, we asked Sam to name as many as he could. I think he got like 120. He got over hundred like for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. It has been a few years though. I don't know if he's, he's probably as fresh. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's locked in there though. Might be. 
I would see. I we I I missed Pokemon. Pokemon like it got big when we were older. We yeah. was like high school, and I was like, and that was the thing. Yeah, I was time. I was a little old for it. Yeah, and so I played it in secret and didn't let anybody know I was playing it. Um, <laughs> okay, but because it, it was weird. Like that was around the time where if you liked Star Wars or if you liked Pokemon, you would get made made fun of. Yeah, nerd culture was not as mainstream or as cool. Right now, you could see a grown man with a Pikachu shirt not bat an eye. Yeah. And back in the late 90s, no chance. Yeah. Well, I no think, like, chance. The rise of the internet and technology has made yeah. nerd culture cool. Yeah. Like, I, I still have a Star Wars hat that my grandmother sewed a patch on because I wanted a Star Wars hat and I just found a plain gray hat I had a Star Wars patch and asked my Mimi to sew it on for me because I wanted a Star Wars hat. I wore it to school one time, got made fun of and never, never wore it again. Oh, man. But I still have it and... I just, I still wear it every now and then just to kind of like, you know, be like, no, like, like that, it, that, reclaim that, it. Kind of, you know, yeah. I, I tell Archer all the time, I'm like it. never let anybody make you feel bad about being passionate about something like that mm -hmm. is the most rotten thing someone can do is to mm -hmm. try to take away something that brings someone else joy. Like that's just disgusting. Well, and, so funny. Like I was just talking with Ethan earlier today. He was, he saw, I think I did like a, a Instagram video about the Pilot M90, which I love, super cool pen. And he said a customer reached out to him and said, I'm so glad I saw that video. He's like, I have been carrying that pen around for like two decades. And he's like, everybody makes fun of me for this like small kind of weird looking pen. And he's like, I've always felt ostracized for carrying this pen around, but I love it so much. And he's like, I didn't know that there was like somebody out there who would appreciate it until I saw that video. Everybody in the fountain like, pen world I know loves those pens. I don't know, I don't know. And maybe they're newer to like the fountain pen like know. kind of community or something. Yeah, the M90, the, the Mew, and the Murex. I feel like everybody well, that's why I told, That's cool. why I told Ethan, I was like, Ethan, that is like one of the more coveted pens yeah. in the fountain pen world. Like this dude, like he's just hanging out with the wrong people. Yeah, I guess so. He needs to like, <laughs> right. you know, but like that's what's so cool about doing what we do. And like, I think fountain pens probably touch on some of the same elements that you're talking about with like the Star Wars and Pokemon stuff yeah. like that. Like it's, you know, it's a hobby that you can really get into and not everybody's going to understand it, but who cares? It's your thing and you connect with other people who are super into it and get a ton of like value out of that. So I don't know. I appreciate it more and more as we age. Oh, absolutely. And uh, yeah, who cares? Whatever, do what you want. Passion. Pick, pick up a tenor sex after everything. 21 years. Friggin' honk away. It's absolutely. sound weird, but whatever. Honk <laughs> away. <laughs> It does sound, I sound like a friggin' goose dying sometimes <laughs> with some of these notes I'm trying to hit. I'm like, ooh, my tone is uh, not where it used to be. I love get it. my embouchure back, like, you know, but we're getting there. I spit so much too. I'm just like, <laughs> literally like spit is dripping out of the key holes, like onto my fingers as I'm playing. Cause oh I'm like, God. man, like when I go to the dentist, they're like constantly having to, I, just, I generate a <laughs> lot of spit. <laughs> When I go to the dentist, they gotta like keep the vacuum like <laughs> in my mouth to keep me from like drowning as they're working on it. Oh my, my god! Yep, it's one of the weird things. Now we're in the turkey hammock you know, zone. You know too much Brian's about talking me about now. his saliva generation. That's right, but it was a new way <laughs> for me to experience how much saliva I produce by oh my god. having it drip all over Brian. my fingers as I play saxophone. Jeez. It's weird. I don't remember doing that in college, but maybe I had gloves on. It was like military things, so and maybe that was it. Maybe it would have gotten wet, but whatever. Now you know too much. Anyway, hope you all have a great week. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Right on. Oh, my God. Polyester and butt sweat. Yes. Bad combo. Usually I'm okay. Okay. Today? Not, not mm -mm. in a good situation.